begin, I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, we have Senator Brian Birdwell, who is a native Texan, decorated military veteran, and lifelong conservative Republican, proudly representing Texas Senate District 22. Born in Fort Worth, Senator Birdwell is a graduate of Lamar University in Beaumont, uh, U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, and the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where he earned a Master of Public Administration degree. Senator Birdwell serves as Chairman of the Border Security Committee, and the Senate Committee on Natural Resources and Economic Development, which provides oversight to the Railroad Commission, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, and the Workforce Commission. Since 2013, uh, Senator Birdwell has served as Chairman of uh, United States Senator Ted Cruz's 22-member U.S. Service Academy Nominations Board. And next we have State Representative Matt Shaheen, who serves the citizens of District 66, and the Texas House of Representatives, representing West Plano and far north Dallas. He currently sits on the Human Services and Licensing and Administrative Procedures Committee. Previously, Representative Shaheen served five years on the Collin County Commissioner's Court, representing the citizens of Precinct 1. As a commissioner, he represented Collin County on the Conference of Urban Counties Policy Committee, the Texas Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee, and the North Texas Criminal Justice Committee. Representative Shaheen is a native of Virginia where he received his bachelor's degree from Randolph McComb College and won all conference honors in football. He also holds a master's degree from SMU. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us this morning. So this morning we have a great opportunity to explore issues facing students in Texas. Uh, let's start with each panelist delivering opening remarks and discussing their top priorities for the 88th legislative session. <laughs> yeah, but senators tend to filibuster, so I hope you know, so we tend to be long-winded. Um, uh, well, first, it's great to join you. Uh, with the future generations of, uh, of leaders that will be uh, sitting up here in, in 15, 20 years uh, replacing Matt and myself, so it's true to join them. Uh, the things that I'm working on that are priorities for me are things that allow the legislative branch or afford the legislative branch in Texas uh, to be heard and influence the action because the challenge that we face in Texas is as a part-time legislature, there's a 19-month interim, and as it relates to emergency and disaster powers, this past week I just filed again uh, what we passed out of the Senate last session but could get it to the governor's desk, constitutional amendment relating to emergency and disaster powers that allow the legislature, which is the, you know, what Madison said in Federal 48, that the legislative branch must necessarily predominate. In a two-year biennium, that's 760 days, the legislative branch, or the executive and the judicial branch is at work all 760 days. The legislative branch is only at work 140, and out of that 140, the first 60 days, uh, we can only do either what the governor gives us as an emergency item, or it takes four-fifths of the body, Senate or House, to take it up on the floor. That's an immensely high uh, threshold. What that functionally means is that a 760-day legis or 760-day biennial calendar, the legislature is only fully armed with its authority as the legislature for eight out of 760 days. And so when we go into the interim, if there's an emergency or disaster that has an immense amount of effect, whether, whether it's two-fifths or more of the counties, half the population, a couple other criteria, that allows the legislature to be heard so that the people's representatives can be heard as it relates to what's going on with that emergency and disaster power. There are also other areas I'm working on. One of the things that I fear that I see in, in not only in the state but in the country is a, I would, I would deem it a sense of insubordination. When the legislature writes laws, we write laws, not suggestions. So when you have a county commissioner, a sheriff, a city council, a mayor, say that, or a district attorney, say that 
I'm not going to obey this law. You know, Matt and I are not in that building over there getting paid 600 bucks a month to write suggestions. Okay? I mean, I, I, I'm a clear soldier. If I'm given a lawful order, whether I like it or not, you salute and move out. We've got, and it's on both sides of the aisle too, I, I would argue that. But when we've got entities that are geopolitical subdivisions subordinate to the state of Texas, that elected officials or appointed officials in those geopolitical subdivisions say, I'm not going to do something. What caused me to work on this was the Tampa District Attorney in Florida said, I'm not going to obey the state's abortion laws. Governor DeSantis then suspended that individual and said, thank you for your interest in public service, you're done. The state of Texas has no such parallel. So I've dug into that matter and I've got a constitutional amendment that would that would do that. So many of the things that the, that I'm working on relate to the legislature being taken seriously by subordinate geopolitical subdivisions, being able to be heard, and be the predominant branch of government that, that Madison said that we should be at the state level. Because the people's representatives are most closely elected by the people and are most closely related to what it is that they want. And because of our structure, there's a, I, I could give you more items that I'm doing, but it's those things that are thematically allowing the legislature the ability to work all 140 days. The citizens' representatives can speak on their behalf, particularly if it's an emergency or disaster uh, of certain scopes. Those types of things that relate to legislative authority are the key things I'm working on, plus Border security, that's, been, that's consumed most of my interim that we continue to work on and then as Chair of Natural Resources and Economic Development, protecting our oil and gas industries that are the economic driver. Uh, more than a third of the state's budget surplus comes from the severance tax uh, related to oil and gas industry. And the, the current administration in Washington, D.C. is very hostile to the oil and gas industry. And that's very dangerous to not just the people of the state of Texas, but to the country as a whole. Who are <laughs> Wonderful. Representative Shaheen. Well, good morning. I can tell I'm in a room of conservatives because it's Saturday morning and y'all are in suits. You guys look great. <laughs> you look awesome. And you ladies look wonderful too. You're dressed up and look uh, really nice. You know, we, we get the opportunity to speak at um, a lot of different events and uh, both of us are just incredibly excited to be here with the Young Conservatives of, of Texas. We are so optimistic and excited about your future. Uh, so I know we're going to spend a lot of, of our time talking about the idiot legislative session uh, that we're in. But if I can just start off by saying I really truly am excited about what you all will be doing 20, 30, 50 years from now. You live in the best state in the greatest country in the world. Think about that just for a second. And one of the reasons why I'm so excited is you are already influencing and making an impact on 30 million people that reside in the state of Texas. That is just outstanding, it's awesome. Um, when I was in, in, in college in my early 20s, I couldn't tell you what the difference between a Republican and a Democrat was, because quite frankly, I wasn't really paying attention. Um, and then things changed, things evolved, and, and got seriously engaged. But the, um, this legislative session will be, will be profound for a, a couple different reasons. One is, of course, two years ago, we had a catastrophic event in our, in our state. Uh, that impacted our grid and shows some vulnerabilities of, of our, our state grid. I've been working on that really since last legislative session and in the interim. And you know, the good news is the, the, our grid is much in a much better place as far as hand, handling really extreme weather events. We've, we've required some weatherization, critical mapping of infrastructure, all those types of things. But we're pivoting now to there's a thousand people that move to Texas every day. Every day, a thousand people. And just people naturally want to live in Texas because it's awesome, right? We just got talk done talking about that. So there's a lot of things that as legislators, we need to make sure that are in place. Water and roads, important infrastructure, those types of th 
things, a very sound education system. But you know what? We need electrons to flow as well. And so there's some legislation that I'm working on just to ensure that the, the different supplies of energy that are used to produce electricity in the state of Texas doesn't swing over to one area uh, too much. And specifically what I'm talking about is renewables. A lot of people don't know Texas has one of the cleanest grids in the world. 25% of our grid is solar and wind. We actually lead the nation in wind in the electricity produced by wind. We're number two in solar. And in a couple of years, Texas is going to actually go ahead of California and be the number one producer of electricity using solar. And that's that's fine. Renewables have a place in our grid, but we're the ninth largest economy in the world. In the world, Texas is. We're bigger than Russia, a bunch of different countries, right? And so we just need to make sure that not too much of our electrical supply is based on the weather, right? That kind of makes sense. But there's, there's certainly room for renewables. We just don't want too much. So we're, we're working on that. We have this funky thing going, in, going on in our culture right now where we're sexualizing children. And uh, that is not a debate topic. That is not allowed. And so we are going to, we, we, I've already filed legislation to protect our children uh, in our schools and outside of schools as well. Uh, you've probably read about some of the materials that we're finding in our schools. Uh, so we have, I've filed legislation to hold book vendors accountable to that. And a lot of the theme this legislative session is, this legislative session is around parental choice. So I have legislation uh, on school choice as well. It's more on the uh, what's called education savings accounts versus vouchers. Uh, we'll just there, there's lots of different proposals out there that uh, that we'll see. And um, but lots of different issues. I've already filed like uh, 50 bills. And just to give you a perspective, and I'll wrap up here. One bill is the equivalent to when you all either had to or have to now write a paper and study for a test. So every bill, when, when you talk about somebody filing a bill, that's what we essentially is the equivalent of what we have to do is, is write a paper. We've got to, of course, get the legislation written, but we have to write our layout and all that type of stuff as we lay it out in committee, lay it out on the floor. But then it's a test. In the Texas House of Representatives, if you've seen it, there's a big old front mic where we go and lay our bill out and, and try to convince the body of 150 people to vote for our legislation. Well, there's also a back mic. In that back mic, any of the other 149 members can go and ask you questions and try to tank your bill. So you got to be prepared. So anyhow, lots of work to do. Uh, the senator's right. You know, we, we meet every two years for 140 days, and so we can press a lot of work uh, into a short period of time. But we should have a good 88 session. And and Senator Birdwell, to your point, you've outlined those constitutional parameters for the legislature: when decisions can be made, when actions can be taken. And one thing that happens early on in the legislative process is the lieutenant governor and governor respectively releasing their priorities. The lieutenant governor releasing his priorities and the governor releasing his emergency items. Uh, so can you shed light on what impact those will have on the legislative process? They'll, they'll always have a, an impact because it, it's kind of like the quarterback calling the play. You know, the, the, the 11 guys that come out of the huddle, you know, if they're all on their own agenda per se, uh, you don't have a very coordinated effort. Look, there, there may be places that there'll be disagreement among the senators, so that the lieutenant governor is our presiding officer, but he carries an, an immense amount of weight. But there, be, there may be times where there are disagreements, but there are gonna be a couple things I'm gonna carry. I've, I've filed uh, what will be Senate Bill 29, the one that relates to uh, COVID Mac, uh, vaccine or mask mandates. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna the senator that's gonna carry that lieutenant governor authority. That also happens to be a uh, one of the governor's priorities, because part of the reason of, of the uh, in listening to the governor speak, both at the state of state and in some of the comments that, that he's made in, in other public settings, is that part of his executive orders were related to protecting citizens from the the blueberries of the state, shall we say, you know, the Harris County, Travis County, that by having his executive order in place, it keeps. Uh, 
the respective local officials there from putting mandates or other things in place in the absence of his. And so one of the things we're going to do is, is with Senate Bill 29, come forward and say, you know, geopolitical subdivisions as it relates to COVID-19, there'll be no mass mandates, no closure of schools, no closure of churches, uh, no vaccine mandates, those, and that's for government entities so that the private sector can still make its decision, but anybody with a governmental authority cannot make such decisions. So it would be a preclusionary bill where the legislature precludes anybody other than the legislature making such a decision. Um, uh, some of the other priorities that the governor put out, uh, Governor Abbott put out related to uh, border related items. Uh, I've got some bills related to that. Other members have some bills related to that. And he said anything related to the border, um, I don't know that that committee is going to see as many bills as state affairs. And the challenge that we have in the, in the, in the board of talk is that when, you know, whether it's Governor Abbott, Governor Patrick, anybody stands up and says border security, or a federal official, be it a, a congressman, you know, Senator Cornyn, Senator Cruz, or a federal official says border security, we as constituents, have the same picture in mind of what border security is. The problem is, is that if you if you look at the span, it's, I talk with my hands and having to hold a microphone is, is <laughs> I can't do my hand just. But if you consider the you know like a a baseball field, if the federal government has from you know the first baseline to the third baseline. In authority over border because Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4 is what gives the federal government authority over a uniform system of naturalization. That's the border security clause that relates to how people come into this country lawfully. The state only has the width of the first base foul line in the, as it relates to authority. So when you stand up and say border security, you want the same thing I want but the over 99% of the authority related to it is the federal government authority that we are precluded from. So what are, the, what are the things that we can accomplish in that very small lane of authority that the state has? We can enforce state law at the border. There's things, in fact, that one of the things that the governor mentioned was uh, increasing penalties for human smuggling um, uh, for, uh, uh, from where they are right now for a two-year sentence to a 10-year sentence. I'm going to carry that. Um, so those are the types of things that they they emphasize where we're going to go. What's the you know a head coach's game plan is the best way to, to describe that. And so the pieces that I'm carrying, I'm sure Matt will carry some of those in, in the house as we've already discussed with uh, uh, with sexualization and things of that nature. So you know many of us have our own particular lane that we work. And uh, the lieutenant governor is my quarterback, and the speaker is uh, is Matt's quarterback. And Representative Shaheen, can you also expand on the significance of these priorities? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the the dynamics of the House and the Senate are, are really very interesting. So you you have the here we go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, and I was like food fight over there. You know, we're the yeah. yeah. Oh, you know, I go over to the Senate. It is the most boring place in the Capitol. I mean, you walk in, it is like a library. Like they're whispering over there. We're, and we're, we're the opera and they're the wrestling matches. Okay? <laughs> you, you go, hey, when y'all go to the Capitol, come over to the house. Don't even go to the Senate. I mean, we're loud. We're having fun. There's pocket, there's 150 members on the floor. We're having conversations. Literally, this, you know how your teacher tells you you have to be quiet? The Speaker of the House has to gavel like half a dozen times to tell us to be quiet because the person at the front line can't be heard. So just come over to the House, we're just where it's happening and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, but the dynamics, and I, I want to go into this t type of detail with this kind of audience because uh, quite frankly, y'all know a whole heck of a lot more than uh, like a lot of uh, you know constituents that I have in my, in my district. But you have the, the House presiding officer is the lieutenant governor and he's elected statewide. Well, over in the House, you have the speaker of the House, but he's elected, as you know, by the members. So that creates this, this dynamic where it's, it's often the case where you have the governor and the lieutenant governor very vocal about priorities and those types of things. And the speaker of the House to some point, but less so. And that's how it's designed, right? Because in the House, it's really the members, for the most part, that are driving it through. I've had discussions with Speaker Phelan 
And he'll just tell me, he goes, Shaheen, Republicans have a majority in the House. We need to pass legislation. We need to pass priority legislation. Now, he'll speak out on some things, as I, as I said, but it's really, it's, it's very interesting, uh, different dynamics. And, you know, the border, I, I thought the sen senator played it right. We spent $4 billion. We've deployed 5,000 National Guardsmen, 5,000 DPS troopers on the border. That's a thousand mile border. And to the senator's point, that's a, that's a federal responsibility. Statute is geared towards the federal government. In fact, one of the things that we wrestle with, and everybody talks about, hey, when a DPS officer um, uh, gets in custody, a, uh, an illegal, why don't you just take them back to the other side of the border? Well, there's federal statute that says that's kidnapping, right? So there's, there's just a bunch of different dynamics that we have to work on. Um, I've been down the border several times, and it is atrocious what this, what this administration is doing. They have literally created just a human disaster. It's a human, humanitarian disaster. One of the last times that I went down to the border, there was a five-year-old little girl that crossed that river by herself. By herself. I know you all are aware of the, of the sex trafficking uh, that results in the state of Texas because of that. The senator alluded to that. Texas is number two in the nation in human trafficking, in sex trafficking. And the average age of a, of a victim of sex trafficking in the state of Texas is a 12 to 14 year old little girl. This is serious stuff. You can read articles about the, um, the, the, on the labor side, you have a bunch of individuals that are here in the country now illegal, illegally, that they're doing some just awful jobs. Uh, uh, labor laws are being violated across the state. They're, they're being taken advantage of because they're in desperate situations. This is not a humanitarian way to handle our border, and it's not a humanitarian way to handle people that are desperately in need of help because they're trying to escape from, um, you know, incredibly difficult uh, economic and quite frankly just dangerous situations in the nation. Our federal government is failing us in so many ways on that border in, a, in addition to fentanyl and all those types of things. One other thing that I'll add and I'll, 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 I'll stop is uh, is property taxes. Our property tax burden on our citizens, on our landowners, our homeowners, our businesses is just unacceptable. And so you'll see a lot of discussion in this session about uh, property tax relief. Our economy is doing so well in the state of Texas. Let's do a red state thing here real quick. State of Texas has a $33 billion surplus that we're sitting on. $33 billion. California has a deficit of billions of dollars. Just, is it 22? $22 billion. So you got a 50 plus billion dollar swing between our two states. That doesn't tell you the difference between a Republican and a Democrat, a liberal and conservative, you'll never get convinced. Um, but so there's a lot of discussions about half of that $33 billion surplus that we have providing property tax relief uh, as well. So that may or may not excite you now, but I can tell you when you have your first home, you're gonna love that. <laughs> so with all of these challenges, there is hope as well. Last year we saw historical progress in the pro-life movement. Uh, with the release of the Dobbs decision, how has Texas responded and how can we defend the progress that we've made? We'll start with Senator Burwell. I'm not sure quite how to answer that because I haven't, when the Dobbs decision came out, we're, there's only, as it relates to the life of the mother, uh, we were, in fact, uh, Senator Paxton had the, the bill last session in 21 that should the, uh, Will the Wade decision be overturned or vacated? We would return to pre-1973 law because actually the Roe v. Wade case came out of Texas, out of Dallas County. Uh, so we return to that statute that says uh, life of the mother. Uh, so that there's only a very small sliver of places where an abortion would be lawful, but otherwise uh, they are they are unlawful. So there. I think the most important thing to maintain that would be to maintain a pro-life majority in both bodies. Because what made the, it, it gets back to my first point about legislative authority. The best thing about the Dobbs decision wasn't that the decision in and of itself overturned Roe v. Wade. It's that the Supreme Court returned it to the states 
where the Ninth and Tenth Amendments say it belongs. And then in returning it to the states, who speaks for the state? The legislative branch speaks for the state. And that's what I think is the most important. So the, the continuance of a pro-life perspective is important because it's the, it's the first principle. You know, it's right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Not to pursue your happiness or liberty to take life. Okay. So, so, uh, so maintaining a pro-life perspective in your state legislature is the most important and effective way to maintain pro-life status in the state of Texas. Yeah, I cannot tell you how excited I am about this topic. I want y'all to think about this right now. Every month in the state of Texas, thousands of little babies are now living. I'm a volunteer at my church's pregnancy center and uh, I never, ever, ever thought this day would come. And, uh, you know, I know there's debates back and forth about Trump and his Twitter and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, he probably should be a little nicer than he is. But Donald Trump made that happen with that Supreme Court. Let us not forget that. So I, I think the challenge before us today now, and the center is, is, is absolutely right, now we have to protect what we've achieved uh, in, in, its, in its life. But I think the other thing that we need to, and this is really, really, y'all, this is, this is your generation, right? This is you taking the, the torch forward, right? Is now that we are celebrating thousands of little babies that are now surviving, what do we do now? Right, so I will tell you, my, our pregnancy center, of course, we're still going to minister to women. Uh, we're still going to share the gospel with them, know that Jesus Christ loves them. Uh, we're going to take care of their physical needs. Uh, we're going to guide them through that decision. Um, but what are we going to do now? I mean, think about this for a second, right? If you look at the statistics, the majority of little babies that are born in the state of Texas are Medicaid babies. So what that's telling us is that the majority of babies being born right now are in a, in a, a low-income situation. So I'm a very strong believer that we need to step up and start supporting these moms and so start supporting these little babies. I think we do it through our churches. I think we do it through our the nonprofit organizations. And I think as a state, we need to reprioritize and reallocate the health care dollars that we spend. If you look at the Texas state budget, we spend over $80 billion on health care. Now that's a wide spectrum of things. That's when you're severely disabled. Texans that are in uh, state hospitals to Medicaid and, and, and the like. So why not reallocate dollars, right, to support mom, to support little baby, right? So I think that's a lot of the new dialogue, quite frankly, I hope conservatives lead on. Because we are pro-life from the womb to the tomb, not just when the baby's in, in, in the womb. And this is a significant opportunity for us, and it's an exciting opportunity for us. So another issue that's come up has been uh, obscenity, especially when it comes to uh, books and literature in schools. Um, if we think back to the pandemic, uh, many students took their education uh, home as everyone was uh, becoming isolated because of the pandemic. And parents started to gain an insight into the education their children were receiving. And so with that in mind, especially coupling that with uh, drag shows and their impacts on children, what steps are we taking and we can take to protect Texas children. Senator Burwell. Why do I always have to go first? Um, I, I can go, I'm working yeah, on I was going to say, you, why don't you go first and I'll follow up. Yeah, I will, I will tell you, uh, uh, state statute never contemplated, the last legislative session two years ago, never contemplated what's going on right now. This is nuts. Um, so I, I mentioned it before, I've worked on, and there's other legislators, both in the House and the Senate, we filed legislation uh, to protect children from obscene materials getting in our, in our schools. What, what's happening, is, like, look, not, we gotta remember, as conservatives, 99.9% .9 of the librarians and teachers are awesome, they love those children, and they're teaching, uh, serving these children, because they, they love children. My wife is a teacher. Um, what, what happens is, 
uh, like in my district, a new school will open up and, it'll, and, and the school will go to the book vendor and say, hey, I need 10,000 books, I need these topics, use these rating agencies, and boom, 10,000 books literally show up. It's actually the book vendors that are putting this trash in our schools. It's not, uh, and just, just as a side, I love the whole movement across our nation to flip school boards and make them more conservative. That's awesome, and we, we need to continue to do that. But it's, it really isn't the situation, well, maybe Austin ISD is doing this, but for the most part, you know, trustees aren't going online and ordering these pornographic books for our, our uh, schools. It's the book vendors. And uh, during the interim, I was going off and meeting with these, these book vendors, and one of them apologized. We go, and, you know, we would read the trash to these executives of these, of these book vendors that were selling this trash to our schools. And like, one reaction was an apology, and we're gonna do everything we can so that this trash doesn't get in our, in our schools. The other one, who is a board member of the book vendor, looks me in the eye and says, if somebody wants to buy that book, I'm gonna sell it. I got up and left. When you have somebody that corrupt, that evil, having a discussion really isn't gonna be very fruitful. So I filed legislation that if a book vendor in the state of Texas, no, if any book vendor sells to a public school in the state of Texas, material that meets the obscenity definition, they are banned from doing business in the state of Texas from then on out. This stuff is just, it's just there, there is no debate. Um, and then we're gonna, we're, we're gonna mandate portals uh, be available to parents so they can go online and check XYZ book that they don't want ch their child uh, to use. On these drag shows, uh, I'm just, just perplexed that I'm having to deal with this. Well, we've, we have filed legislation. You can't, you know, conduct yourself in a disgusting sexual manner where you're describing sex acts and you're singing songs with F-bombs in front of children. I really didn't think we would have to legislate that. I'm not sure where all the adults are. Now, I will tell you, this is an incredibly, incredibly, incredibly small percentage of our population. It's actually a very small percentage of the Democrat party, although some of them, I think, don't know what to do. Some of them try to defend it, some of them don't. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, the base foundation of all this, this is not negotiable. We're gonna protect our children. May I add one thing to that, if I may? Please. Michael, the, uh, uh, Matt's right. Um, when we did the, the privacy bill back, was in 19, you know, we never contemplated that we would ever have to figure out, you know, that men go to the men's restroom and women go to the women's restroom, you know, remember the declaration says the laws of nature and nature's God, and so we never really thought we actually had to put in statute, you know, which restrooms to, to go to. Um, as it relates to sexualization, you mentioned the, the drag shows, but uh, I, I think you also mean this in, in this arena, and that's child mutilation as it relates to, I don't know if that was what you were yeah. trying to drive to, but I think Senator Hall is going to carry it in the state Senate. Look, we want parents to be in charge of their kids' education. Um, I, the best example I always give is, is you know, my kids are out of school, I don't know if, you, if your kids are out of school, but my, you know, my son's married in his 30s. But it's the same customer relationship, like when I take my Ford truck to my, my car dealer and say, change the oil and the air, you know, the filter, rotate the tires. The mechanic is servicing the truck. I the truck the customer. The teacher is the technician, providing the commodity called an education to the child. Is the child the customer or am I the customer as the parent? The parent's the customer. Now, in our school districts more broadly, anybody paying the property taxes to support that, that school, whether they have children in that school or not, is the, the, the strategic or, or operational customer and the tactical customer is the parent. We want parents to make those decisions. But just like when you drive down Interstate 35, there are guardrails that say, or lines in the road that say, you know, don't cross the yellow line, don't, you know, we don't want you in the ravine, we've got guardrails on. And there are guardrails as it relates to permanent mutilation of a child at four or five or six or ten or 
I mean, I just could not contemplate we would ever have these these discussions about taking little Johnny and turning him into little Johnny. And while we want the parent to make the best medical decisions as it relates to vaccines and other things, there's a boundary, there's a guardrail at which you you may not, you know, that you may not cross. And I think the Senate's going to uh, the Senate's going to lead on that one. Y'all going to lead on the, the sexualization. Uh, it is tragic to see some of the folks that have decided to detransition and hear their stories, and the media doesn't give you those stories of what that's like because of the permanent disfiguration. You know, I and maybe I'm not the right guy to say that because I've got some permanent disfigurations from an act of war. But to have parents deliberately do that as a permanent disfiguration for what seems to be a, a cultural fad, um, I mean, that is just unconscionable to me. Uh, it is child abuse. Um, and so the Senate and the House are going to work on that as it relates to both sexualization and, uh, uh, and uh, gender mutilation related items. Can we get it done this go around? Yes. I think there's a, the, the House has a more difficult process uh, to go through. Matt will tell you that I mean, getting something out of the Senate is not easy, but getting something out of the House is more difficult just because of the structure rules, uh, the food fights, uh, for lack of a better term. But can the state of Texas do that? Yes. All right, wonderful. Uh, to kind of shift, shift gears slightly, uh, as college students, uh, we value the safety of our campuses and communities. In Harris County, for example, we've seen revolving door bail policies that's led to preventable crime. What spurred this uptick in crime, and how should the legislature address the issue? Um, what spurred it is, is a couple of things. You've got, um, everybody's heard the name George Soros, you've got Soros-backed DAs that refuse to prosecute. This is part of the what the governor talked about in his state of the state and some of his priorities as it relates to mandatory sentencing and Senator Huffman in the, in the state senate is going to carry the, the bills relating to uh, no more cashless bail where you just get to continue to do the revol revolving door. Uh, that is, so the recidivism you see from what is a serious criminal not being detained, released back out onto the street, Whatever you sanction, you get more of, and whatever you punish, you get less of. And we're getting more repeat recidivism. Uh, I would also add uh, that the state has a role here in, in the, on the one side of the sword that is the punishment aspect. But I think much of our problem in society, many of our, our political problems, I'm just going to speak it boldly for a moment if I may, Many of our problems stem from our spiritual problem as a country. Um, there's a, there's a, a separation of function between church and state. There's not a separation of influence. And the problem is, is that, you know, I, I, when you've all had one of my Democrat colleagues called me and said, you know, we've got to do something on guns. And I said, no, we need men to be fathers to their children and families to be strong, and that starts in church. And government can't mandate that. Can't mandate your particular faith or, or that you be in church. But kind of like what we heard when you did the, the prayer breakfast Wednesday, and Dr. Evans came and spoke and told us, you know, gave us not just encouragement, but the warning about, you know, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and because when we turn away from God, we are living the depravities that He has turned us over to as a country and as a society. And if we don't return back to our, our areas of faith, um, government can continue to punish left and right, and that's its function, as in Romans 13. But our churches and our, our faith in God are what's sort of the real solution to much of what we're dealing with as it relates to crime and the deterioration of the course of our society. So we are approaching uh, just a few minutes left in our panel, uh, but I think what uh, a lot of college students in this room would like to know is how can we affect the legislative process? Well, if you've got a, 
if you've got a golf club, you can uh, you know come to the Senate. Um, if, if you've got a folding chair, you can go to the uh, uh, go to the House. Uh, stand your ground, remain engaged. Um, unfortunately, what happens? You know, you see this dynamic. Um, on y'all are actually, you know, in many respects, you know, y'all. You know, when I was on a college campus, uh, you know, going through school, there was not this this, you know deep liberal swerve, you know, that there was that presence, but we, you know, I went to school during the Reagan years, uh, there was pride in our country, you know, there wasn't this just badgering of, of uh, from academia, the, you know, how much the country sucked, um, you know, the, the challenges that you face as a political minority on a campus, I think are immense, but I, I know I didn't live you know, in the sense of, I, I better write my paper this way or I'll, you know, I won't get an A, and if I really say what my research finds, you know, I'll get a, something else. I never, I didn't have to live there. But staying engaged, even after you graduate from college, is now one, because once you go out into the work world, you're going to see that, you know, what life is really like, uh, the reality that the ivory tower is not, you know, all it's cracked up to be. Um, Remaining engaged, and engaged doesn't necessarily mean being uh, hostile uh, to uh, to elected officials. Uh, the, the table I was sitting at with the group of young folks from Mary Hart and Baylor who are, have ringside seats here, um, uh, we talked a little bit about the, uh, social media, and, and anybody can get on the keyboard and, and tell Matt and I how much we suck. I get that all the time, um, but somebody that gives me thoughtful. Uh, practical application of how policies in fact impacting them, um, being engaged in that process, helping good candidates, whether that's knocking on doors for your, your preferred candidate, um, you know, whatever that mechanism is that you help good governments. And it's not just, you know, go, go help somebody run for Congress. You know, when's the last time any of y'all helped somebody run for a school board? When's the last time anybody helped? City, because school boards and city councils are nonpartisan, but most of your elected officials, that, like Matt, you know, he became a, a state representative because he'd been a county commissioner. And what was he before a county commissioner? Most people started lower levels of government and again eventually worked their way up. And it's helping good people that have a proper conservative worldview, they're grounded in their faith, and those are the folks that y'all need to go help. And then work on your campuses, stand your ground. You're right. Don't be afraid of being right. Don't be afraid of, uh, of telling your classmates that, uh, that think socialism and communism is the way to go. Uh, this is a, like Matt said earlier, you know, I have sweat, bled, frozen, and burned for my country. And even with all of our maladies, it is still the greatest place on God's green earth. And this state is still the best in this country. And it's still worth fighting for. Pick your fights carefully, and if someone picks one with you, don't back up from it. I could just wrap this puppy up and say ditto. <laughs> that was really good. I, I think um, I think the only other thing I would add is uh, maybe if we take it up a level here. You, you know, uh, because of COVID, because everybody was isolated, there's a lot of people asking a lot of questions right now. I think people, it's kind of weird, but I, I think our world, I think our nation, I think our state, I think, I think people are doing a lot of deep thinking right now. I think a lot of people have questions. And I mean, there's silly questions about can a guy get pregnant and all that kind of stuff. And, um, but I, you know, we've been talking a lot about the culture. I think the culture, it's, it's kind of like, a, I've always described it as, as it's a spring and when you compress a spring, right, the pressure at some point, that spring just flies off to the side. And I think we're at this point where we're flying off the side. And um, I think we're seeing some darkness, I think we're seeing some evil in our world, and I think what our world needs is Jesus Christ. I think our nation needs revival, and quite frankly, I think it's happening right now, and I think it's happening in your generation. 
which what just happened down in Asbury uh, in Kentucky. Are you all familiar with what's, what's happened there? There's a lot of people just asking questions. And for a worship service at a school just to fire off like it did and thousands and thousands and thousands of people come from the nation and that thing literally continues on for days and days and days and days. You can't explain that. That's the Holy Spirit moving. The Holy Spirit is moving through our state and through our nation. Right. And the Holy Spirit is moving through your generation. Right now. And so I think what you need to do is, I, I think you need to be the answer. I think people are asking these really deep, profound questions, and there's some silliness, and we need to address that legislat legislatively, and we will. We're gonna protect children, but I think this is deeper. I think people are really asking some very spiritual questions, and Jesus Christ is the answer. And so my hope, my prayer, is that when you all go to bed tonight, each and every one of you, there's a lot of you here tonight, not there today, and I think that's awesome. But when you all go to bed tonight, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to pray. Massive, massive movements through our human history have started through prayer. Jesus Christ with 12 disciples. There's several dozen of you here. I'm going to simply ask you, please remember to do this. Just pray. And just ask God, Lord, you placed me here at such a time as this. What do you want me to do? Just ask them that question. This is not complex. Will you raise your hand and promise me that you will pray tonight? And just ask that question. And do not be, for, do not be conformed by the world, but renew your mind. And by testing, you will know the will of God. I promise you, God will put something on your heart. Go to others and talk about it and test it. Will God open doors for you? Will God close doors for you? But something is stirring, and it's stirring your generation, quite frankly, not ours. So that would be a really awesome thing for you to be a part of, maybe even be leaders in. God bless each and every one of you, and thank you for having us. And with that, we've reached the conclusion of our panel. Thank you, panelists, for joining us. And the next panel will begin shortly. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Maxim Marino. I'm here representing the Heritage Foundation. Um, so I work as a research associate in our Center for Education Policy, uh, where we're constantly trying to um, work to fight for school choice across the states. Um, so my background is I worked for Congressman Brian Babin in Washington, D.C., and I worked in on his uh, pro-life and religious freedom issues. Um, and through that time, um, I realized how important kind of school choice was and how um, education is really the foundation for everything else. And so um, I've moved into kind of the school choice arena after that, and um, I've never looked back since. So. Awesome. Good morning. Um, I'm Randon Steinhauser. And I, uh, after college, moved up to D.C., worked on Capitol Hill, very similar story. Um, and from there, just kind of fell in love with education policy. Ended up going to the American Federation for Children uh, and working for Betsy DeVos, who later became Secretary of Education. Traveled to about 30 different states, working on grassroots campaigns to mobilize parents in support of educational freedom. Um, while in D.C., I met and fell in love with a Texan. So here I am. Uh, four children later, and we worked together to advance uh, liberty-minded um, legislators, elected officials, public policy, and specifically educational freedom. So I'm here today on behalf of Young Americans for Liberty. I uh, work with a number of different organizations across the country. Really excited to see all of you here and hope that we can recruit you to join us in our efforts to expand school choice. My name is Emily Sass. I am a senior fellow for education policy at the Texas Public Policy Foundation down the road downtown uh, in Austin. Uh, I got into this work, I started my career teaching, thought that was what I wanted to do with my life, really loved the kids that I got to work with, uh, but also discovered a passion for public policy and education policy in particular as I was finishing up college uh, and then moving into a full-time teaching career. 
uh, and then realized, I, I said during that time I would only leave teaching if I thought I could serve and help a larger number of students than I was currently helping. Uh, and I decided that that was the case. So I became a political staffer, worked for an office at the Capitol here in Austin, then wound up working for Senator Ted Cruz. I came back to Austin to work for, uh, just on education policy issues with the Texas Public Policy Foundation, been there ever since. Um, so I come to this because as a teacher, I saw, as a teacher and then as a student, uh, coming out of my personal education experience, I saw the importance of families having options and the ability to figure out what works best for their child. Every child is different, uh, and they need the ability to explore opportunities that are right for their families. Well, uh, my name is Keisha King. Uh, I got into this as a mom, really. Uh, just a quick background story, because I, I feel like this is always important. Um, in 2017, uh, I was totally illiberal. I had no idea about Republican Democrats, and had this big life transformation. God spoke to my heart, told me that my skin color had become an idol in my life. Blew my mind. I was like, uh, what am I doing? And uh, then God was pushing me into politics. I was like, you're crazy. No, thank you. And so I just started volunteering. And during that, in that volunteering, I started working for the RMC in 2020. And as we know, what happened in 2020 with COVID, um, my, I have two daughters, uh, 16 and 14. But at that time, um, my oldest daughter was asked what pronoun she wanted to go by the first week of eighth grade. And I was like, what in the world? And so, <laughs> and my, I mean, my daughter was like, wow, like, what, what, why, why are they asking me this? And so I wrote the teacher, emailed her, she never responded, and then um, same teacher, a couple months later, I told my daughter, I was like, don't worry about it, just be vigilant. Well, you guys know, most teenagers are not, they don't typically listen, but she actually did. So she recorded the conversation in that same classroom where the teacher was pushing critical race theory. And God had already prepared me for that because in 2019, I had learned about critical race theory, and Governor DeSantis, I'm from Florida, so I don't know, there's some debate about the best so I don't know, <laughs> but, but um, Texas is, is wonderful though. <laughs> and so Governor DeSantis was having a hearing to ban um, critical race theory at the Florida Board of Education. I went down there, said my piece, the governor retweeted my speech and went viral and I just started to get uh, more involved in this process. and. As I got involved, I saw the pushback of you know, all these crazy people, and I didn't understand why this is obvious. You're teaching kids to be racist, or you're, you know, you're asking them what their pronouns are. Didn't understand it, and so um, just got more involved in the school school choice side uh, because I realized if we don't get our kids out, you have a short window of time to educate your kids, and if they don't come out of these indoctrination camps they will be indoctrinated. And so we'll, we'll get more into that, but that's how I got into it. And I will warn you now, I get very passionate about these topics, so bear with me. <laughs> Emily, to start us off, can you talk about what is school choice? Sure. So, School choice, writ large, is really just the idea that families should be able to select a school rather than be assigned one. That can happen within the public school system or it can happen outside the public school system. Uh, the controversy starts weighing in uh, when you talk about how, uh, whether they get to take state funding with them because in Texas, uh, we have a constitutional obligation to provide for the education of Texas students and create a system that allows them to be educated and receive a general diffusion of knowledge. So public, uh, school choice, <coughs> let's talk about it in the public sector first. Uh, this can look like a public school system saying, instead of you being assigned to a particular school because that's where you live, and that, that's traditionally how it's done, right? Where do you live? Ah, you are in this school's attendance zone. You will go there. Congratulations and have fun. Enjoy the next 12 years of your life. Um, is it public districts do have the ability to say instead of just being assigned that you do have the ability to request another option uh, that can be you pick like we, you're not assigned anything and you pick uh, or it can be you're assigned the school but you can request to go somewhere else in our district and we'll we'll try to accommodate that so there's space for you to go there uh, and, and 
slot you in. Uh, within the public sector, there are also things like charter schools, if you're familiar with those. Charter schools are public schools. They are funded by the state. They, they are run by, through contract instead of through the normal uh, independent school district system. So charter school providers have to go through a very rigorous vetting and application process. They get fully vetted. Uh, by the Texas Education Agency, and then they go through a veto process with the State Board of Education as well. If they pass all of that, then they are awarded a contract to serve a certain number of students according to the specs that are set, set out in that contract. In return for all of that rigor and some reduced regulations, uh, they are held to a pretty high academic standard, naturally, uh, and then they are, like I was just alluding to, allow some more freedom in the way that they conduct their model, the way they hire their staff, the way uh, that they design their program for students. So they're allowed some flexibility and some innovation. Districts, uh, school districts can actually partner with charter schools to do the same kind of thing in their own districts, or they can set it up on their own. We have districts of innovation, districts can kind of come up with whatever they, model they want here. What I'm really, it, to summarize all of this up, Districts can provide as many choices for their students as they want to. They may not always want to, and the choices that they choose to provide may not always be right for every student. Does that make sense? If your child is interested in mechanics and your district has a performing arts magnet school, that performing arts magnet school is wonderful and going to help a large number of children, probably. It's probably not the right fit for your mechanics-minded student. Uh, who wants to go into engineering. So you're going to need to still look for another option for him. And I'm saying you're a student like you're all parents. Okay, I mean, you were just picking careers not too long ago, right? You're probably Some of you are still picking majors, right? I'm guessing. Uh, or regretting the one that you picked, because I'm working that stage. And anybody there, senior year, you're like, shoot, why I pick this? Uh, so you know, we're all going through this process, and as families are, are, are making these decisions and trying to help their students along a path, the more options that they have to build on their child's inherent skills uh, and talents, the better. Uh, and then we move into the private space. Uh, in the private space, uh, obviously private schools come to mind, families can homeschool, there's a lot of freedom in taxes from homeschool kid right here. Uh, so there's options that are external to the ISD system in Texas as well. Um, what this looks like in many states, but not in Texas yet, is it, the state allows the funding they've already assigned for a student to follow that student based on the parent's choices uh, to the school uh, or, or vendors, homeschool vendors who are buying textbooks or something that uh, a family wants them to go to. So in Florida, for instance, a family can apply for a scholarship and use some of the funds that were already dedicated for their child to pay for tuition at a private school rather than having to go to a school to which they were assigned. This is private school choice, as it's often referred to. The public school choice, where the district creates the choices for you, and they may or may not work, but you get some level of choice. And then there's private school choice, where you can take advantage of public, op public options, but also opt out of those options and choose something or create something for yourself. That was great, thank you. This next question is for all the panelists. Why do we need school choice? So I think as some of the panelists have already mentioned, but a lot of times uh, we saw during COVID, a lot of public schools um, broke faith with parents. Um, so this is in regards to school closures. Um, this is in regards to the curriculum that was being taught. Um, and so a lot of parents kind of realized, you know, what, what's going on in these spaces and how do we need to get involved? And that's kind of what spurred the school choice movement that we're seeing today. So the Texas Education Agency reported a decline in public school enrollment in the 2021 school year. The Homeschooling Coalition reported a 300% increase in the amount of homeschooling students um, that were being homeschooled in the 2021 school year. So that's fascinating. Um, so I really think that those numbers really are articulating the fact that parents are wanting more choices for their children and education choice is really going to be able to provide and empower families to be able to not only choose the learning environment that best fits the needs of their children, but also aligns with their values. And that's what's so important about education choice. Yeah, I would just add, does anybody here think that government knows best? Raise your hand. 
because you're not in the right place. Okay, so fundamentally right now what we have is a government-run system that's government-funded and government-run. Ultimately, what we want to see is that you take out the government-run part of it and allow parents to use those funds, their tax dollars, these dollars do not belong to anyone but the taxpayers, to choose the when, the where, the why, the how, and the by whom their children are being educated. So with an education savings account, you as the parent, one day you will be there, and I'm the parent of identical twins, by the way, and I can tell you that even they learn differently. Okay, so like every single person here has a different learning style. You have different passions, different curiosities, different things that you're, you find interesting. But right now our system is designed where you waste a lot of time. In those most formative years of K through 12 where you're sitting in a classroom and if you're gifted, you're waiting for everybody else to catch up. If you're struggling, you're never gonna get where you need to be, right? So they teach to the middle if they're teaching at all. Many of our schools during COVID were either shut down or had a perpetual substitute. So we're seeing outcomes not match the amount of money that we're throwing into a government-run system. So I would say we need school choice because we need educational freedom. We need students to be able to learn in an environment that is not created on an outdated um, system that does not prioritize the individual. So liberty, freedom, limited government, and personal responsibility ultimately the first person that should be responsible for educating a child is their parent. If they don't feel like homeschooling is the right fit, they should be empowered to take those dollars and find the right environment that works for them. And again, it can be homeschooling. It can be a virtual school. It can be a magnet school. It can be a combination of all these things. While we don't have an ESA here in Texas currently, I joke that our family is currently living an ESA lifestyle. I have four children. They are at a university model private school here in Austin two days a week. The other two days a week, my husband and I both homeschool them. And we have a homeschool co-op. And we hire a former educator who was an elementary school teacher and during COVID thought this is madness. So she started her own company, increased her salary threefold, and has 20 families that she works with. Only 20 families all throughout the month. She comes to our house twice a week and we do sports, and we have a co-op. So we are living this lifestyle of allowing our children to flourish in a variety of different settings, and guess what? They're super happy. And most of the time, they just play. <laughs> I love that mental picture. Um, just for a second, let's back up and establish why education matters to a room full of folks, the average age that we're looking at right now. Uh, and one is because you are going to pay a whole lot of money into education over the course of your lifetime. Whether you rent, whether you eventually own a home, or all you do, congratulations. Um, you're going to, everybody in Texas is invested in the public education system simply by virtue of the massive number, amount of property tax revenue, and other tax revenue, that goes into the public education system. We are making a massive statewide investment authorized by our state constitution into the lives and futures of the next generation of Texas. The kids in public schools right now are going to be your colleagues, they are going to be your employees, they are going to someday be playmates with my children, I have a two-year-old now, um, and, and eventually probably your children. Um, the public education is where the future of Texas is decided. Why should school choice be part of that? Why should parents be part of make their own decisions? Well, one, we want a quality system. Uh, and when families have the ability to weigh into that and feel that their voices are being heard, it's going to help that happen. Families should be, you, as a consumer or a parent, should feel that you're getting a quality product as you put your kids into an environment they're going to be in for 12 plus years. There should be transparency in that process. You don't get quality without transparency. There should be respect when you have to raise concerns about quality or transparency. When you raise those concerns, you should feel that your voice is heard and the concerns are being addressed. And if that's not happening, if at any point these things are breaking down, this quality, respect, and transparency, then you should have a choice to go somewhere else, to take the dollars and your child, one of the most precious people you will ever know, and put them in a place that you do feel is going to serve their needs and meet those requirements for you, that quality, transparency, and respect. 
I'm going to compare it to transportation really quickly, uh, just because I'm guessing the number of parents in the room is on the low side. Uh, think about roads and bridges, okay? We want those to be quality, right? Nobody wants to drive on a janky bridge. We've all heard stories over the course of our lifetimes about bridges that fail and not cool. Uh, we want that process to be transparent. As those bridges are getting built, we want somebody checking in, right? Like, okay, did you use the right kind of concrete? Uh, did you follow the engineering specs? Are we on track? Is this going to get built before, you know, my kids die? Um, transparency is great. Um, and then we want those, those concerns and those check-ins to be treated respectfully, correct? Like, ah, we hear you. Yes, we did do this. Yes, we did do that. We want those to be respectfully and thoroughly addressed. And if that's not happening, there should be the ability, and there usually is, to terminate a contract and find somebody different to build that bridge because we don't want to mess with bridges. We don't have that in public education in Texas. We don't have that key backstop measure of, I can go somewhere else, unless you are willing to pick up your entire life, maybe change jobs, and move to a different school district, and even then you're locked into what that different school district is willing to assign to you. So, in the important task of building the future generation of Texas, we don't have the core system that we would expect to be set up for something as basic and essential as building roads and bridges. Well, if you send your, if your child is being educated by Caesar, do not be surprised when they come home speaking like a Roman. So, <laughs> five, five days a week, eight hours a day for 12, 13 years, your future children, most of you, will be indoctrinated. I, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different approach. So the policy side is clear. We need education freedom because you need your kids to be, you need, families need the option to be able to cater to the uniqueness of your child. I have, my youngest sort of is a special needs child you know, they have the same mom and dad, but they are two totally different kids. They need, their needs are totally different. I think we have to understand what these, what the left, or what the, those that are in charge of this system, what they want. They want to radicalize the children. They are trying to build, and I, I hope I don't sound too radical myself, but they want to make the next generation's minions of the state, communists, Marxists. This was the goal. They're doing the long march through the institutions. This is not a myth. It is not fantasy. It is, it's real. We are seeing it. The cultural decline, that was the plan. It was the plan. The, do you guys remember when Barack Obama released that little skit thing about the life of Julia? Do y'all remember that? Anyway, there was this woman, her life was literally from the day she was born to the day she died, it was tied to the state. And the hub of it, the whole thing, was the school. They want to, you guys, y'all know this, when you go, when your kids in a public school, sometimes in, even in some of the private schools that are, uh, if, if it's, it's just in the public school, they will say, you want to get your kids' eyes uh, checked? You want to get your kids' hearing, hearing checked? You want, it's like a medical system in the school. It is the, everything is a centralized hub in that system. We need education freedom so you can break away, you can decouple yourself and your child from this indoctrination camp. It is not a public school. Schooling is different from education. So it's a school in the sense of it wants to tie you to the state because these are state institutions, they are state employees, they work for the government. That's when you're sending your kid into a public school, you're sending them into a government facility. And they have a lot of power. They have a lot of control. There is a lot of money tied into the public school system. Think about it, there is, edu there is transportation because of busing. It, literally every industry, all right there, transportation, food, uh, uh, uniforms, clothing. Um, it's literally, it's, it, it's, it's every industry. And it's a central hub 
to indoctrinate your kid. I, I pulled my kids out. My kids are now uh, homeschooled. One is in a homeschool co-op that does uh, know what your kids do. Uh, I, we hired a teacher. She we sit, she goes uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. She when she first went into uh, I pulled her out. She tested at a, she was in she was going into ninth or she was in ninth grade. She tested at a fifth grade math level. In five months, three she was only going two days a week at that point. Two days a week in five months, the kid, my daughter was at a 10th grade math level by the end of the year. In five months, two days a week. So what in the world are they doing five days a week, eight hours, seven, eight hours a day that they could not even get ready to do? And this kid is, she's a smart kid. She was walking around the house reading her history book for fun. It was like, she's like, mom, did you know this? And you know, she's so excited to learn now. The goal, in my opinion, is not to educate children in public schools. You can look at the test scores, you can look at what, you, you can see it. The proficiency rates are disaster, it's a disaster. They just uh, had a report that came out in Baltimore. There were 23 schools and zero kids out of 23 schools were proficient in math, none. And how much were they spending? Do and they spent like 18, over like $19,000 per child. I, I spent, I don't even spend that in a year with, <laughs> with uh, my daughter's homeschool co-op. So it is insane the amount of money that is tied to the system to not even get what you pay for. Like you're literally sending them there to get an education and they come out thinking that men can be women and, men, and uh, women can be men. Like you need a refund if you go into an institution thinking that you're supposed to learn and then you come out thinking that you don't even know basic biology. That's unacceptable. And so I think every day we literally see the case for <laughs> expanding school choice. I will shut up because I can keep going. Here's the researcher's project. Here's, here's the tragedy from the researcher's perspective of what she just said. 96% of students who fall behind academically never catch up. These kids are behind forever when this happens in the majority of cases. 4%, 4% will get back on grade level. That's, that's not a number I like at all. It's atrocious. Oh, we were just talking before, just really quick, and I promise I'll shut up for a And they're, they're kids. You know when you go to like Walmart, the cash registers, they have like pictures on the cash register for, you know, for them to easily check out, check someone out. These kids who are, these young people that are working at Walmart, they cannot, they can't, uh, they don't know how to work the picture cash register. Like, I, 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 I want you, I'm really trying to impress upon you how serious this is. People cannot, they're not learning in these institutions. They are not. And if we don't lobby our legislators, if we do not press this issue, y'all, y'all's kids are gonna be sitting next to some dumb kids. I'm, I'm just, I'm serious. And you're gonna be, you're, your kid is gonna be coming home to you like, mom, dad, like what's up with this? And you, like, how are you going to fix that at that point? If we don't do something let's, now. Let's talk really quickly though about why it hasn't happened in Texas, if that's okay. Can we transition yeah, to that? Because I think that's really, really important. We have our friend from Florida where they have a school choice program. We have 30 plus programs across the country, if not more. I mean, we have it's growing, right? We just had two universal ESA bills passed into law within the last couple of weeks, not here in Texas. So as we heard, there's a lot of money that goes into this system, right? It's taxpayer dollars that are going into a system that is designed as a jobs program for adults, for bureaucrats, okay? I want to point out just a couple of key facts we have superintendents in Texas who are making over $300,000, $400,000 a year. Why would they ever want competition in the marketplace? We all love free market economics here, right? We're conservatives. We understand that there's a role for limited government. But when you continue to perpetually put money into a system that is designed to protect the jobs of those who are in charge, there's never going to be accountability. Emily mentioned the beautiful marketplace option of public charter schools. Guess what 
what's different about public charter schools? If they do not continue to provide results and they continue to fail after only three years, guess what happens to them? They shut down. When is the last time that we saw a neighborhood ISD, think about Dallas, what we're seeing happening there, with generations of children being left behind because they never got the education that they were promised? Those, those schools do not close down. They do not. We are seeing exactly your point, a coupling of government-run entities with no accountability and no outcomes and no results. And parents, quite frankly, are fed up. So more than anything, I would say over the last 10 years, I've been working on school choice here in Texas. 10 years ago, I had to go into parent groups and just talk about what is school choice, why you should have freedom. It is no longer the case. Parents are fed up, they're fired up, and they are coming out in droves to say, no more government indoctrination camps. We know best, not the government. So I would say we're on the precipice of seeing some really exciting things happen in Texas. But we must be honest with ourselves about who is funding the campaign to, de to defeat school choice and educational freedom. It is the teachers' unions. It is the school superintendents. It is the school architects. They want to build more government buildings because they get more contracts, right? If we start looking at where the dollars are going, they're not going into the classroom. They're not going to the students and their educational outcomes. They're going to the bureaucratic bloat at the top. And therefore, when we talk about inserting choice into the marketplace, that's competition, and that is a threat. So whenever uh, school choice gets brought up in the Texas legislature, as you were talking about, Randon, the opposition brings out a lot of objections, many of which I think are not well-founded. I was wondering if each of y'all could talk about a school choice myth that they bring up and debunk it for us. Madison, we can start with you. So I'm sure that you guys have heard this, but typically opponents of education choice will often make two arguments about its effect on rural areas. They'll say, first, education choice will not help in rural areas because there are few to no alternatives to the district public school system. Then they'll also say that education choice will simply destroy the public school district system because so many students will leave for alternative options. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but guys, both of those are false. Um, and one of my heritage colleagues, Jason Badger, has done some fascinating research on these two issues, and I'd love to be able to share it with you guys. So he has found that actually about seven in 10 rural families live within 10 miles of a private elementary school. Isn't that crazy? Um, charter schools, although they are scarcer in more rural areas, but in Arizona, where they foster the creation of charter schools in rural areas, we'll see that eight in 10 students actually live within the same zip code of at least one charter school. What? And then on top of that, so states with robust education policies have seen a significant increase in the amount of education options in rural areas. So for instance, in Florida, rural private school enrollment has doubled over the past two decades. And in Arizona, right, rural private school enrollment has doubled over the past eight years. does not harm rural school districts. Because in fact, Arizona, who has, like we said, the most robust K-12 education, universal education savings accounts, actually, their rural schools are improving much higher than the national average. So why are legislators saying these things? It's because they're afraid of change, and they don't want to look at the research, the research that is true and that is founded, that education choice really empowers families, empowers lives, and actually really does help rural families and rural areas succeed. So this is my favorite logic. Just listen to this for a moment. If we have school choice in Texas, our public schools will fail because so many people will leave. But our public schools are great. We just can't give them a choice. Because if they leave, we'll be decimated. And they're going to leave if we give them a choice. Just think about that for a minute. Inherently, that is an argument for school choice. 
They want to trap families in their government schools because they know if families have a choice, they will leave. They will leave. So my myth that I want to bring up is about accountability. At the end of the day, parents know best. And parents are the ultimate accountability. If your child is not thriving and succeeding, trust us when we say you are going to love them more than anything you've ever loved in your whole life. And all you want for them is to succeed. But guess what? If you can't afford a private school, or you don't have a charter school, or you get on a wait list, you're one of the 100,000 plus students who are on a charter school wait list in Texas. 100,000 plus students. Or you can't homeschool because you're a single working mom and you've got an hourly wage job. Guess what? You are stuck. And we believe that the accountability lies within the parents to take those dollars and hire and fire every single person who is educating their child. Because if they are not doing their job, they do not deserve the time with your child. So I believe that accountability resides with the, fam with the parents. When it comes to private schools accountability, we'll often hear, well, if parents take their dollars to these unaccountable private schools, they'll be indoctrinated with religion. Well, amen to that, first of all. <laughs> Second of all, private schools are oftentimes held to much higher standards by themselves. They don't need the government to tell them how to do their job because if they don't do their job, their customer base will leave. It's accountability, it's free market economics, and it's time to get big government out of the way. So what I will hear a lot, uh, this, this is an objection that has reached the status of a myth, is that if we allow private school choice in Texas or in any other state, fill in the blank, um, it will destroy homeschooling because people will decide to homeschool and they might use state funds to make some of those purchases and that will destroy homeschooling. This one actually does have some merit behind it. We know that where the dollars come from does matter. But what we across the country, this is kind of an advantage of being a late bloomer uh, state in a way on this issue. There have been no increases on homeschool regulation of any kind for the last two decades, including in the states that have created options that allow families to choose private options like homeschooling or private schools. In other words, the concern should be thought through. Are we doing something that would allow government control over private schools or homeschool homeschooling? The answer is no. We have not seen that play out and there are several things that we can do to make sure it stays that way. Uh, one is to make sure that the program is opt-in. You shouldn't have to spend your money at any particular place. That's why we're talking about doing this in the first place. So if a family wants to homeschool entirely on their own and not apply for an education savings account uh, to use those dollars, they do not have to. That is how I was raised as a homeschooler. That's how current homeschool families have to do it. That is how homes of people who want to homeschool right now have to figure out a way to make that work because that is their only alternative. An education savings account or other private school options would allow them to choose to opt into a program that allows them access to some of their state funding if they want that. Second, you don't include federal dollars. The Federal Department of Education probably shouldn't constitutionally exist, uh, but it does. Uh, and here we are with a federal department that is kind of a morass of crazy regulations. It's very hard to tread through. Even even, even public schools will tell you how how. how terrible it is to try to wade through all of that and most private schools opt out of any programs that include federal funding uh, or, or tread in those waters very quickly so don't include federal funding in that that makes your program a whole lot more efficient a whole lot more streamlined uh, and you don't have to worry about wading into that space uh, and then finally make sure that uh, you've got the basic accountability that you need and no more and write that very clearly into statute and i promise you everybody working on this knows that this is part of the equation. You make sure that if, if anybody ever tries, and people do try, without school choice all the time to regulate private schools and homeschoolers, if somebody tries using this program, the language setting up the program says, oh, by the way, that cannot be done. You cannot regulate any of these things. You cannot regulate curriculum. You cannot regulate hiring practices. You cannot regulate what that self-created uh, accreditation program looks like. All you can look at is whether the money actually went to educational purposes, according to a list. You can look at that and make sure that they didn't spend something on, you know, 
uh, as something that's, that's not uh, an eligible education purpose. We'll call that basic financial accountability to prevent fraud. And that's it. That's what you can look at. That's all you can touch. Everything else is up to the, the families and the schools that they choose to educate their child. You can write that in. If you ever have any issues, you can come back and point to that. But like I said, even in the states that have had this for the last couple of decades, hasn't been a problem. Why? Because they know parents will be absolutely furious if they try. It's not gonna happen. It ain't gonna happen. Homeschool, now that I'm a homeschool mom, I'm like, yeah, right, try it. <laughs> um, so one of my favorite yet annoying myths is you'll hear them say, well, if you take the, ch if the money follows the child, then you're pulling dollars out of the public school system. So the, the, the very first question you have to ask is, oh yeah, so when, when a family moves to like another district, what happens then? That money leaves, it leaves that school. So the idea that you taking control and that money following your child is literally the same thing is if you moved if you moved across town to another district, it's not going to affect the public that public school any other way as if you left the state or it, it voted with your feet for some other reason and your child was no longer in that in that school. It's just another way to um, to make you hang on to this romantic idea of the public school system. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. It's, it's, it's crazy that we even have to have this fight um, because the idea of freedom is like literally how this whole, this whole great country started and we're literally trying to tell people that we want more freedom and then you have people telling you, no, you can't have more freedom. No, you have to stay stuck chained into, you know, to, to this uh, system. And so it, it is just a lie, but that's, um, I hear that a lot. You're, not, you're trying to defund the public school system and, you know, conservative parents, we get accused of that a lot. And it's just one of those things that you think for like two seconds, it just doesn't make any sense because how does it happen with any other way that you pull out, pull your kid out of the public school system? The money follows them wherever they go to that new school, so. Emily, do you want to add state and, and local tax dollars, though, and how some local dollars will stay behind? They literally get money to educate a child who's not there? Uh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, so uh, public education is funded through federal, state, and local dollars. Uh, a lot of people think that this, the nation, U.S., gives us a whole lot of money. They don't. About 10% of public education funding in Texas comes from the federal government, and it's kind of like a, a really picky foundation. Like, yeah, I don't think you mentioned this, only for these kids, and you gotta give us a report, right? It, they, they fund about 10%. And so then we've got state and local. That's, I think, here, kind of equally divided. Uh, state tax, state gathered tax revenue dollars, and local gathered tax revenue dollars. Uh, those local dollars are property tax revenue, and the state usually com uh, comes from other sources. Um, so the local funds are broken up into two camps uh, maintenance and operations. Uh, which is the tax that they charge property owners for running the school, day-to-day -day operations, paying teacher salaries, uh, probably getting the lawn mode, uh, stuff like that. And then there's INS, interest in sinking, which is the debt that they take out to build facilities. facilities. Um, that is locally levied, has to be approved by our local taxpayers, but continues on in perpetuity. If students leave, if the number of kids in those buildings that are built and getting paid off leaves, that money stays. That does not travel with the child. Those are locally levied dollars that stay that are part of the district revenue. Yeah, the reason I bring that up really quick is because oftentimes we hear from our opponents on school choice, but what about the building? <laughs> it, it speaks for itself. <laughs> it's gonna be paid for, that's, yeah. yeah. Well, we have run out of time. Can we get a round of applause for our next <laughs> Thank you all so much. And stick around because we're about to start our next panel. Our higher education panel. My name is Luke Rosegate and I'm the chapter chairman 
and co-founder of the YCD chapter of the University of Dallas. I am, I am pleased to uh, moderate today's panel and uh, introduce our star study class of panelists. From the Texas Public Policy Foundation, we have Tom Lindsay, who is the Distinguished Senior Fellow at Next Generation Texas. He has more than two decades experience in education management in, and instruction, including service as a dean, provost, and a college president. From Alliance Defending Freedom, we have Lathan Watts, who serves as the VP of Public Affairs at Alliance Defending Freedom. And prior to joining ADF, Lathan spent nearly 20 years in various roles within the political, public policy, and nonprofit sectors. And finally, from Speech First, we have Cherise Strump, and she is Speech First Executive Director. Uh, prior to uh, working with Speech First, she was at the Heritage Foundation, and she is also the host of Speech First's new live show and podcast called Well Said, where she interviews experts, activists, professors, and students about free speech in higher education and American culture. To do a roadmap for this panel, we're going to begin by talking about what higher education should be, uh, talking about some ways in which it fails uh, to live up to its mission, and finally, uh, by ending, uh, discussing what some possible solutions uh, to these problems we see are. So Tom, I'd like to begin with you. What is or what should be the telos, the end, the goal of higher education? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. That's a great question to begin with. Let me first thank YCT for holding this conference. I've been to several YCT meetings in the past, and you folks are doing the Lord's work. And you're to be congratulated for it, and it takes a lot, as I'm sure you know, it takes a lot of moral courage to stand up and speak the truth when, somebody, when everybody else is screaming at you. So keep up your good work. It's also an honor to be here with Speech First and the Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, all of us, we have different approaches, but one thing we all agree on, all of us who are here, is a statement attributed to Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln said, the philosophy taught in the classroom in this generation will be the philosophy practiced in the legislature in the next generation. I think Lincoln's right, and on that basis, I have to say that if free speech and debate die on our campuses, in time, free speech and debate will come to die in the public square. And at that point, our experiment in self-government will have come to a fatal conclusion. Now, the the model for higher education, the telos or purpose or end of higher education, uh, is really born of Socrates' proposition, which he said at his trial, which he lost, uh, his first famous free speech case in history, didn't go well. Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living for a human being. That is the genesis of liberal education in the West. It's no accident that the words liberal and liberty have the same root. Liberal education is an education in and through and for liberty. And the highest liberty, which we learn if we get a liberal education, the highest liberty is the freedom of the mind. That is freedom from unexamined assumptions, whether they're swings in intellectual fashion, partisan politics, ideology, Liberal education as practiced at a genuine university transcends all of those partisan differences. Therefore, liberty at its peak is identical with the pursuit of truth. Now, the truth seeking, as Socrates' trial and execution demonstrate, is not without its dangers. And therefore, institutions, colleges and universities that are devoted to cultivating intellectual liberty, they depend for their existence, for their safety, on being located in a system of political liberty. Where there is no political liberty, you will not find academic freedom in any country that doesn't have political liberty. And this is what I mean about Lincoln's connection here between philosophy taught in the classroom and the philosophy practiced in the legislature. In subsequent questions here, we'll go into what's being taught in the classroom now. But the point is, 
when we talk about education, oftentimes it goes off into abstruse debates. But the best way to keep our focus is this. When we say education, what we mean is our future. Right? That's what Lincoln's statement means, right? So we say, well, what, what should education be? Well, what would you like the future to look like? Would you like it to look free and innovative and robust? Or would you like to see it one of conformism and shaming and a lack of any opportunity to speak one's mind? These are what the stakes are, and this is why it's so important to think about the purpose or telos of higher education. Thank you so much, Tom, for that framing. Now, if we move to uh, Charisse and Lakin, could each of you talk about what are some of the issues that you see in higher education today, um, especially at the, the university level? Well, some of the most um, concerning issues that I see on campus is actually it's not so much in the policy, I can get into some of the policy issues that I see on campuses, but it's primarily the level of apathy that I'm seeing on, within the student population. Um, um, not questioning or pushing back, obviously that doesn't fit the bill for the folks who are in this room. Um, I really admire your gumption um, and the effort that you put into uh, really exposing some of the stuff you're, you're seeing on campus and really getting it out there and pushing for what's right. However, a majority of students, from my experience, actually tells me that there's, there's just, it's, it's, I want to say apathy, but also some kind of complacency, right? Because they think that it's okay. They think that what is happening is right. And that the authority figures on the campus who are creating these policies, for example, that shut down speech um, or target and investigate students for their speech, um, they think that's okay because the university must have their best interests in mind and that the university is some sort of parenting device for them, right? Because really what it's, it's coming off is like, and I don't want to insult anyone, but uh, it's almost like there's an extension of childhood now in college. Like this is like your opportunity to continue to act um, like children. And it's no longer, right, it's <laughs> no offense, but it's like that's what's happening. It's like that you're looking at these, it's, 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 students are looking at these authority figures as if they're, they have their best interests at hand, they're not questioning, they're not pushing back. Um, so I was, for example, I was walking around UT Austin's campus yesterday with, um, with my team and we were doing kind of these like man on the street type interviews about what their thoughts were on free speech and expression and what they thought about if there should be laws against hate speech or if they thought there was, um, there were any policies on campus that they just thought were unhealthy and bad for their education because they slowed down on speech. And almost everyone just had these, had these answers where they were just incredibly indecisive and not, they hadn't even thought about these questions before hadn't even occurred to them to even ask themselves whether or not there's something going on on campus that might be hurting their rights. And then, of course, we asked the question whether or not they had ever read the Constitution before they set foot on campus, and most of them said, yes, we read like the first few amendments, and that was it. So they, you know, there's, there's also part of it does come from a lack of civics education, that passion, that drive, that, that helped like, start the American experiment is it, my fear, my biggest fear is that it's getting completely lost. And I'm sure all of you have seen this. This is why you joined YCT. This is why you got more involved, because it is concerning. But I mean, I think the reality is that it's already off campus. All of this stuff is off campus. I always describe universities as the front line, uh, because it actually is, if you don't stop it there, it's like everything with cancel culture, the, the microaggressions, that's all already in, in the companies, it's in, it's in the tech community, and all of these folks, everyone who's being disagrees, they're all going to be leaders in whatever field they have, because whether you like it or not, right now, in order to be a leader in any kind of role, any position in an organization or institution, you have to have a college degree, usually. It's really hard to be able to get that kind of stuff without a college degree, which means every single person that you look to your left and right on campus and look around, they're all probably going to be in charge of something at some point in their lives. And that's actually really terrifying. And I don't mean to sound like a person who's like, oh, the young generation is just like, you know, today. Yeah. Yeah. But, but what happens happening is the reason why I'm concerned about all of that apathy and all of that just kind of like, these guys are going to be in charge of my gosh, you're going to be like running like national security, like crap. But uh, the, the reason I'm concerned is because the university is taking so like full advantage of this, right? They are creating policies that are remnants of Marxist ideology, they are remnants, like there's there are type of policies, policies you see in East Germany, or like Aryan East Berlin, like where you would have, uh, you know, the Stasi asking for informants, neighbors to inform on each other uh, so, uh, anonymously in order to get information and investigate what's going on on campus. These 
exist on campuses. They're reporting systems. They're called biased reporting systems. They are anonymous reporting systems. I don't, you know, so we, one of our first lawsuits at Speech First was against the University of Texas Austin's biased reporting system, which means, and we won the Fifth Circuit, which means a lot of universities um, in, in uh, Texas actually don't have these. But, you know, some of them still, pay. there's still some remnants of them here in Texas. But for the most part, they've uh, modified them so that they could be constitutionally sound and, and not really crossing any major legal lines. Um, but across the country, we looked at over 800 last year, and it was 56%. 56% of universities across the country have these reporting systems. And they're, they're encouraging students to report on each other anonymously, to report on their faculty for incidents of bias. Like, what is that? What's an incident of bias? It's having an opinion. It's speaking up. It's dissenting from the woke dogma on campus. That's what bias is. They will say, even in their definition, they will say it's offensive speech, it's unwanted speech, or it's joking or stereotyping. And that is all constitutionally protected forms of speech. So I, we'll talk later about like what you can do on private campuses because that's a little bit more of an uphill battle. But there's, there's, it's concerning because these, these policies only exist because they have been allowed to exist. And students aren't pushing back and they're not targeting them. And so this is where folks like you come in. It's really exposing you who are running these programs out into the limelight and saying, no, this is bad. And you can't just like, you can't just get us to anonymously report on each other without there being some sort of consequence. There has to be accountability. And we'll talk more later too about accountability measures for the states and other administrators. Very good. Um, I could just say amen and let's pass the collection plate. Um, <laughs> And since we're talking about higher education, I feel compelled to tell you my preferred pronouns are brilliant and charming. <laughs> uh, uh, and b before I uh, sort of answer this question, I want to build on something that Tom said about the purpose of education. And he brought up Lincoln, so I'll see your Lincoln and raise you a, a Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Uh, that's even before the Constitution was ratified, right? When we're going to settle the Northwest Territory, now modern day you know, Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana. Article 3 of the Northwest Ordinance uh, says that it begins with religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of the people. A system of public education shall forever be encouraged. That's what the people that founded this country thought the purpose of education was it was to instill virtue and the values necessary in the next generation of people to live as free men among free men. And I don't have to tell you, most of our college campuses now are instilling the virtue or values that will tear down a republic. Um, so it's very, very important what we're, what we're talking about here today. Um, as, as he mentioned, I'm with Alliance Defending Freedom. People know who ADF is. Yes, no, some, okay. Uh, we're the world's largest nonprofit legal organization. Um, over the last 12 years, we've won 14 Supreme Court cases. Uh, we have hopefully number 15 coming, uh, maybe in May or June, when the court releases its opinion on 303 Creative versus Alanis, which is kind of the follow-up to the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, the free speech case, um, and a lot of the issues in high red revolve around uh, free speech. Uh, you mentioned these uh, you know, bias reporting systems. Um, we had a, a case, uh, Perlot versus Green, three Christian Legal Society students and their faculty sponsor. Um, a student asked one of these uh, CLS students, why is it that your officers have to sign a pledge to uh, live according to certain biblical standards? And it's, I know it's shocking. Christian legal society uh, that they adhere to, you know, Christian doctrine on marriage and sexuality. And the student answered the question. The person who asked the question or others then reported them for their answer. And these students and their faculty sponsor got no contact orders from the university. Basically saying you can't talk to you know, these students because what you're saying you know, is, is, is harmful to them. Uh, so we filed a lawsuit and um, the uh, no contact orders were rescinded and the university ended up paying about $90,000 in damages. Um, and that, on the, in the short term, is how you stop this. Uh, when there is a price to pay for this nonsense, hopefully people will start thinking twice about it. Um, as far as um, other issues in, in higher ed, um, Protecting uh, women's sports in higher ed. 
Um, ADF, you know, we're primarily a, a litigation um, outfit, but we do some legislative work as well. Uh, and our legislative team works with legislatures uh, with some model language uh, that they want to protect women's sports. So we have a sort of a model bill on protecting women's sports. West Virginia adopted that. And of course, they were you know, instantly sued uh, once the law was, was passed. Um, and the judge in the case actually entered a preliminary injunction that kept the law from going into effect. And usually when a judge does that, that means they're probably going to rule against you, right? Uh, so we actually, with our client, uh, uh, Laney Armistead, college athlete, intervened in that case. And after we presented evidence of uh, scientific evidence with expert testimony of the impact of testosterone, the judge actually reversed himself. The trial court judge reversed himself, uh, got rid of the preliminary injunction, and then eventually dismissed the lawsuit. So that law is now in effect in West Virginia, protecting uh, the biological differences between men and women uh, when it comes to sports. Um, for YCT groups, um, a similar, similar group, Young, Ameri Young Americans for Liberty, um, we represented them against the University of Alabama at Huntsville, um, where we challenged the uh, free speech zone uh, policy on campus. Fortunately in Alabama, their legislature uh, had passed a law, uh, the Campus Free Speech Act, and uh, UA Huntsville was not really complying with that, so we took it to court. The uh, trial court judge dismissed the lawsuit, um, so we went to the Alabama State Supreme Court, who unanimously reversed <laughs> the lower court. Um, the only free speech zone the Constitution of the United States recognizes is the United States of America. Okay, so whatever campus you're on, if you have this nonsense, you don't have to put up with it. Uh, so we get about, on average, 10,000 requests for help a year. Uh, we're very busy. Uh, I tell people my job is you know, we get to make trouble for all the right people. <laughs> okay. uh, so let me encourage you just as Tom did. Uh, relentlessly seek the truth. Speak the truth and live the truth. I don't have to tell you that just being a conservative on college campuses today is provocative enough. Okay, you don't have to be intentionally provocative. Just speaking your mind is provocative enough. So you don't have to start the fights, okay? Uh, but when it comes to you, it's time to finish it. And that's when you find us. Um, and it's easy to find us. ADFlegal.org, you can contact us and we'll represent you for free. Your, your, um, the transgender bathroom thing actually reminded me a little bit of something else. So all of you should be prepared and get ready for Title IX because that's coming down the pipeline. The Biden administration has proposed new rules uh, for Title IX, what sexual harassment is supposed to include, and he, they want to add gender identity as a protected class. They also want to remove a very important Supreme Court precedent um, that's included in it called the Davis Standard that basically has a lays out a very high bar for what speech can be considered harassing conduct. So therefore, with gender identity as a protected class and that bar being lowered, all of a sudden, not using someone's pronouns, not using gender affirmation language, could actually get you reported to the Title IX Sexual Harassment Office. There is no limitation right now. So the universities have already shown a propensity to want to do this, or that, to that they'll encourage it, because there's no, there's no limitation on how many harassment policies a university can have. If you go back and look at your school, you'll probably find that you have Title IX plus like an anti-discrimination policy plus another anti-harassment policy. And all of those target speech, all of those will say, you know, things like, uh, we just sued University of Houston on this last year. You know, all of them will say that like, offensive speech, or offensive language that's targeted at a specific group, like for example, tweeting something that there's only um, you know, man and woman could be targeting a specific group with your speech, that could actually be considered harassment under an anti-discrimination or anti-harassment policy on your campus. But Title IX is going to be a federal mandate. It's gonna open the door much more for universities to pursue these types of cases against you. So be prepared for that. It's gonna happen probably late spring, early summer time. Um, we're all ready, we're ready to go. <laughs> legally, but students, like, yes, be ready for, for a lot of that to hit the fan, for sure. Thank you. Uh, Tom, we spoke a lot here about, about free speech issues on campus, um, but another issue that's facing uh, college students in this time period uh, specifically has to do with uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, critical race theory. Uh, what is critical race theory so our students can know when they're being taught 
and what is so harmful about it? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. That's really the question. Because <clears throat> there's a lot of discussion today about CRT, DEI, and then you hear some of the defenses. Well, we're not doing CRT. We're doing cultural competency. Look, every three months they change the name when people figure out what it's about. Right? But it's all... These are all branches of the same tree, and the tree was planted when Karl Marx wrote the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844 in the German ideology. What happened was, <clears throat> in the early 20th century, Marxists in Europe became very concerned because they said, wait a second, Marx told us economics drives everything, and therefore the workers are going to revolt against the bourgeois. But these damn workers, they're satisfied with an increase in the minimum wage and uh, some social benefits. So all of a sudden, economics was no longer the driver, no longer the source of separation. Marx begins the Communist Manifesto. The, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle, right? Uh, rich versus poor, bourgeoisie versus proletariat. In the 20th century, followers of Marx, trying to realize his purposes, have added race and gender. So now it's class, race, and gender has become the unholy trinity of DEI. So culture, <coughs> critical race theory, borrowing from Marx, argues that, argues much more than the common sense historical uh, proposition that in the past America had slavery and, and, and a great deal of racism which was embodied in law. After the 64 and 65 Civil Rights Acts, that was no longer the case. But critical race theory argues no, racism is part of America's DNA. Racism is systemic. It is in everything, in all our institutions. And it's on this basis that they then seek to justify the denial of individual liberty, the denial of free speech, in pursuit of this end. Sharice, I'm so glad that you brought up um, the uh, problems and the gender ideology. When Alexis de Tocqueville wrote Democracy in America, he wrote that America would come to an end through a kind of soft despotism. And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing on college campuses today, whether it be through asking people to comply with pronoun usage um, and silencing speech in which you have people self-censoring. What are some of the policies on college campuses? I know that you've done some work at UT Austin, uh, got some stuff going on at Houston. What are some of these specific policies um, that are being targeted um, to, hope, to help open up free speech on college campus? Policies that are helping speak free speech or policies? Policies that, are that we're trying to get rid of. Oh, yeah. Well, in the soft despotism, also in the line of mentioning Lincoln, he also said we would end ourselves by suicide, right? As that was, uh, which is what we see as well. Um, I mean, I kind of outlined some of the the, the uh, harassment policies and the anti-discrimination policies. A lot of a lot of folks, and I, you know, most of you in this room, I could probably read your student handbooks and have probably looked very closely at the policies that are on your campus, uh, but a lot of folks don't, and. What's unfortunate is that, that a lot, therefore, gets slipped through the cracks. You know, students, when they, like I mentioned before, you have the Title IX sexual harassment policy. Oftentimes, almost on the same web page, they will list additional harassment policies, and then they will proceed to define the harassment. And it's really important that you look at what, how they define harassment, how they define discrimination, because that's where the kicker is going to be, especially on the legal front, because oftentimes they will target constitutionally protected speech within those policies. Um, Additionally, I mentioned the bias reporting systems. But look, a lot of this, and mostly, especially the bias reporting systems, a lot of this is coming out of these DEI offices. So, you know, when you start talking about, like, who, who are we gonna, you know, when you're thinking strategically about, like, what, what's the next goal, what's the, who's the target on campus? DEI offices, a lot of this is coming out of there. But not all of it, right? Because there are, there are policies that have kind of existed, like these harassment policies, for a very long time on campus. And so in addition to those uh, that we've already kind of mentioned, I would say that there's obviously the free speech zone issues, which is I find fascinating because again, when we were at UT's campus yesterday talking to students, I asked them about free speech zones, and they actually thought it was a good idea. Um, 
a lot of them kind of said, you know, it's probably nice to have a safe space so that people can just express themselves. And I was like, well, you don't think that that's something that they should just do generally? And, and they just said, well, no, you want to have like a designated space for it. And it just seems like kind of matter of fact, like, you know, again, this kind of unquestioning um, in Google, in third, it's kind of just like they were, anyway, so it was, it was a little shocking to hear that because I was expecting someone to be like, well, of course, America's a free speech zone and all of these, um, especially on the Texas campus, but I've, I've been told that UT is, uh, Austin is kind of an exception to most Texas campuses. Um, but, so generally though, I think that the, uh, there are, there are a number of policies that you can target, but again, I want to get back to something that I think is really, really important. Um, it comes down to this concept of shame, right? Like, Students should feel shame of their lack of knowledge on issues. That's just, that's how I've always learned. And when I say that, I mean, when I debate people and when I get in arguments with folks about policy issues, and then all of a sudden there's a moment where I realize either I'm wrong or I didn't know everything about the issue, I feel a lot of shame. And it actually forces me to want to go look it up and do my research and due diligence and actually learn something from that conversation. Um, these days, that doesn't really seem to happen in most conversations. It actually seems to be, again, kind of the stuff I outlined earlier where they don't really care. Or it's more, you know, they just kind of go along with whatever you say. Or it's like this kind of this level, like, un, I don't really know where it comes from, this like level of confidence and narcissism where a lot of students are just kind of like, no, I'm right, and you're a bigot, and that's kind of the end of the, the conversation. Um, so there's, and if you start looking at some of the other things too, like the transgender push and all of these things, it's like we're eliminating this concept of shame out of society. So people are just kind of going down these darker paths. And I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, I should just feel good about myself no matter what I think, or I should feel good about myself no matter what I want to do. Uh, therefore, no one's ever wrong. No one's ever, and this is kind of what I'm getting from, from a lot of students when I talk to them, that there's just not like a, a push to be right. There's no like desire to want to win something. Um, and yeah, so I, that's a little off topic, but it's something that occurred to you right now. Perfect example of uh, what you're talking about as far as not wanting to, not wanting to even engage in uh, civil discourse, because that's another thing that we're just losing in, in our country, is the idea of civil discourse, that we can civilly uh, discuss things with each other, even if we disagree, and we might learn something from each other. Uh, our CEO, Kristen Wagner, was invited by the uh, Federalist Society chapter of Yale Law School to come and participate in a panel discussion with, um, I forget the, the, uh, the other side of the, of the debate uh, currently, I'm getting old. Um, this was late last year. Um, and the, the, the purpose of the program, it was on civil discourse, and they wanted to have two people from opposing views and have a discussion. And the Yale Law students um, made such a scene at the event that campus police had to escort our CEO and the other panelists off campus. They had to shut it down because you get everything from yelling, screaming, pounding on the walls, I mean, you name it. Uh, thankfully, I'll give credit where credit is due. Yale invited us back uh, just recently. Um, our CEO, Kristen Wagner, was there, Nadine Strassen, former head of the ACLU, was there, and they actually had a nice civil discussion, and hopefully the people uh, who listened to it learned something. Um, that's, that's what you lose when you can't have a discussion um, with people that, that you disagree, right? Um, now, the one, we talk about the law a lot, the one law that never gets violated is the law of unintended consequences, right? <laughs> When, when, Yale, when the Yale Law students shut down that event, one of the unintended consequences that they might not have anticipated was um, Judge Jim Ho of the Fifth Circuit contacted basically everybody in the federal judiciary and said, I'm not going to hire law clerks from Yale Law anymore. <laughs> and if you don't think that got some attention, it did, right? Uh, because some other judges said, yeah, I'm, I'm in, I'm not gonna hire from Yale either until they fix this. Um, so you never know when a stand that you take is going to, what might seem small in the short term, turns into something really big in the long term. Um, I was at an event last night in Fort Worth. Uh, Babylon Bee did their first live um, broadcast last night from Fort Worth. Uh, it was a great event. Uh, the Babylon Bee, um, when USA Today named Rachel Levine as Woman of the Year, the Babylon Bee tweeted, the first ever Babylon Bee Man of the Year is Rachel Levine. 
and got their account taken <coughs> off of Twitter. And we're told, we'll, we'll reinstate you if you basically say, we violated the, you know, the terms of conduct, this was hate speech, it was potential violent rhetoric. Um, and CEO uh, Seth Dillon, to his credit, said, no, I will never take that tweet down. If you want to take it down, it's your, it's your business, take it down. But I will not say that I did that because speaking truth is not violence. And that went viral. Not long after that, Elon Musk bought Twitter. <laughs> and now some things are changing at Twitter. So you never know when something that, that seems like a small thing, like just standing up and saying, yes, we can have a conversation here, um, what, the, what the unintended consequence is going to be. Uh, I agree. There you go. I agree with the comments here, and I just want to add a couple of things. Um, well, first, if you haven't read the Babylon Bee, please do. It's, <laughs> it's not only the best satire site, it's also the best news site. <laughs> Think about that. It's about the only reason to keep the internet at this point. <laughs> it, it really, no, it, yeah, it really is. And, I mean, and, I, and also, I was talking with some of you uh, prior to this panel asking, well, how, how can we move other students who don't understand this? Well, I know we don't read anymore, so I would suggest uh, that, that you suggest to them a couple of movies. Uh, the 1984 version of the movie 1984, George Orwell understood. And also the foreign film, The Lives of Others, the Stasi were mentioned earlier, uh, Life in East Germany. And it will help uh, them to get a sense of not only what's coming, but really uh, what's here now. And then finally, one other point, uh, mentioned apathy among students. I was at a panel several years ago where uh, speech codes and restrictions on college free speech were being defended as necessary because science has found that uh, kids don't really develop their brains fully till they're 26. And therefore, they can't be allowed to have free speech. Now, I said, that sounds like an argument to lower the voting age, to, to raise the voting <laughs> age, right? But of course, that wasn't what they were looking for. Uh, but this, why be surprised that students are apathetic? Right? When they do get fire in their mind and try to express an opinion, they get shut down. So what do they learn? They learn shut up and go along. And what does that teach them? That teaches them stuff doesn't really matter so much. So I'm not surprised at the apathy. Reese, we've got students here um, from public universities, private universities, um, and I understand that there are different uh, limitations as regards to the First Amendment at those different kinds of institutions. Uh, could you describe uh, what those differences are and what students should do if they feel that on their campus they have an unjust free speech policy? Sure. Um, so public institutions are taxpayer funded. Uh, they are extensions of the state. So they are very much beholden to the Constitution um, because they represent the government. Uh, so they obviously are, when it comes to our way of thinking, they're much easier to sue uh, because when they violate policies, we're like, look, you're violating the First Amendment of the Constitution, or you're violating like, you know, Title IX, Title VI, whatever. Uh, so that, that's, that one's kind of an easy solution. Like you can usually, if you find something that's violating your rights on that campus, very easy to take legal action. Private universities are a little different um, because they're obviously, they're private institutions, um, and they're not primarily funded by the state or um, federal government. And what that means is, you know, there's, there's certain, there's different types, right, because that will tell you, usually up front, that they prioritize their religious views over your um, right to free expression and free speech. And that's something that you sign on to when you go to that campus. So think of this as kind of like a private contractual relationship, right? So you are actually, you know, if, if, if any other private institution, even if it's not religious, if they do say, though, somewhere, where, like when they agree or kind of, you, you in your student handbook or when you come onto campus, they say, you know, we believe in the right to free speech and we want to protect that right. And we actually, we prioritize that. That's really important to us, your right to free speech and expression. And then you find policies that actually contradict that statement or you actually get accused of something that contradicts that statement. That's technically a breach of contract. And that's also, you know, that, that could also technically be fraud. You know, you could actually 
tried to find legal paths to, to sue the university for fraud and breach of contract. So there are legal paths, they're just different in a lot of ways. You know, granted, also if you find out that they are just like violating Title VI because they have scholarship opportunities that benefit certain races um, over others, uh, then, then you can actually, that is like a federal statute that, you know, the private institutions, and they're still the ones who have Title VI, Title IX, and all of these other federal statutes. So looking into the policies and seeing, you know, wait, does my university offer um, special privileges to uh, maybe, you know, maybe not to anyone who's outside of the category of white males? Um, so is that is that something that is there? You know, start to dig a little deeper, look into some of these policies that exist. But I would say also, you know, if you're at a private institution, um, and you feel like you are being discriminated against, start addressing it, but also expose it. Uh, a lot of students have these freshman orientations that they have to go through, through like mandated classes that they have to take every semester on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Sometimes they call it different things. How many of you here, I'm curious, have to take some sort of training session on diversity, equity, inclusion, or um, critical race theory, or, any, or hear about it in your freshman orientations? Okay, so a good number of you. Um, and so, you know, when, you, when that stuff happens, like, there's nothing stopping you from recording it. Uh, there's nothing stopping you from taking video of the stuff in that class and actually just, like, sending it to the news. Because one thing I've learned in, in my experience running an organization that is we are, we really go hard on the PR and comm side of things, um, is that news outlets, especially the big ones, really like it when students uh, themselves are willing to, like, come onto the news. They put a face and name to the story, and they love it when you, like, recorded something that happened on your campus. That is something that is just like, that is red meat for Fox News, and they will play that. And that's millions of people that will be seeing that. So, you know, there's nothing stopping you from recording these classes if you have to take some of these mandated programs, and I encourage you to do it. Um, these, again, these universities should be shamed. Uh, they, should be, they should be dragged out into the limelight, and they should be, uh, you know, held responsible and to, you know, take accountability for their actions. Tom, uh, I feel like we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about some of the legislative ways uh, that we can correct some of the problems with free speech on college campus. I'm told that you had a role in crafting uh, SB 18, which is a free speech uh, legislation for higher education. Would you mind telling us what the problems were prior to that in Texas and what some of those uh, solutions were provided in that bill? Yes, thank you. Um, well, the problems prior were the problems about which we're all familiar, right? Uh, of uh, shout downs, hecklers, vetoes. Um, there is the view out there, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know, that shouting down someone's speech on campus is equally an exercise of your First Amendment right, right? Now, of course that's not true. And also, uh, the court has ruled consistently that even what we call hate speech is constitutionally protected by the First Amendment. So what SB 18 did, and it was passed in 2019, was it required universities to clarify their principles uh, with regard to free speech. It required them, uh, uh, the administration, to submit a report every year on progress with free speech. Um, those were the primary things. It also, it didn't have a cause of action, and some people criticized it for that because they thought, I mean, there is a school of thought that says that universities respond to only two things, taking their money away or suing them, right? Uh, and, of course, the success of uh, both of you shows uh, why that opinion is there. So uh, the uh, legislature didn't do that. Some people wanted to see that. It may be revisited. Uh, because the art, well, the argument on the other side is um, you don't want to punish students be, again because they're young, et cetera. So some of the compromises that have been made is that after the second offense, for example, Wisconsin, Wisconsin does it this. After the second offense, you're expelled, right? First chance, you don't get expelled. Second one, you're expelled. Now, some, even on our side, say, well, that's too hard. They're kids, you know, et cetera. But as far as results go, the University of Wisconsin had a big shout down, brouhaha, I believe it was, uh, it might have been Ben Shapiro. And then they passed this, and uh, in fact, the University of Wisconsin Board of Regents even strengthened it. So then a year later, Katie Pavlich, by whom you've heard, right, conservative woman, I'm not a biologist, but uh, 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 she came to speak, and yeah, there was a protest, 
but the protest was outside, the way it's supposed to be. Right? And they asked the protesters, well, why didn't you shut them down? They said, well, you got this new law. Right? We don't want to. So, right? It worked. And we're running out of time here, so just our final question for anyone on the panel who wants to answer it. Um, is there hope for conservatives in mainstream higher ed? Is there hope for uh, professors who express conservative opinions? We haven't talked as much about academic freedom in that sense, but should we focus on strengthening public education or should we focus on building up our own institutions, conservative institutions like Hillsdale College, uh, the University of Dallas, and uh, Wyoming Catholic College, other schools like this that actually, uh, you know, have policies that promote free speech and uh, virtuous learning. I'm an incurable optimist, so I'm always going to say yes, there's hope, uh, because I look at this room and it gives me hope, right? And y'all are, are proof that you can go to an institution that maybe doesn't value the things that we value and still succeed. Um, but I'm also not a, an either or proposition kind of guy, but yes I am. So, um, yes we need alternatives for people who, like, like just like you said, I went to a private Christian liberal arts school. Uh, my oldest daughter is there now. Uh, we do need places like Hillsdale and, and UD and, and other places so that people have options. But, for the, for the people that are in these other institutions, nothing will change un until the people, you, the customer, demand it, right? And I want to just sort of leave you with a, a quote. I used to have this memorized, but I'm getting old, so uh, I, gotta, I gotta read it here. Um, and this is from uh, the Bible according to Mark Twain. Uh, <laughs> it says, uh, let men label you as they may. If you alone of, the, of all the nation decide one way, and that way be the right way by your convictions of the right, you have done your duty by yourself and by your country. Hold up your head, for you have nothing to be ashamed of. It doesn't matter what the press says. It doesn't matter what the politicians or the mobs say. It doesn't matter if the whole country decides that something wrong is something right. Does that sound familiar? Republics are founded on one principle above all else, the requirement that we stand up for what we believe in, no matter the odds or the consequences. When the mob and the press and the whole world tell you to move, your job is to plant yourself like a tree beside the river of truth and tell the whole world, no, you move. That's what I want you to do. That's, that's why there's hope. Um, if you, if, if you, if you put Mark Twain into practice, uh, then there's hope. So I am, I'm also relatively optimistic and I think I, I do have hope. I will say it's very daunting when you read books like God and Man at Yale and you're like, oh wow, this was written in the 50s. This was a long time ago and it's still all happening today. And you're kind of, oh okay, well what, what's going on? Um, but there is hope because you're seeing a lot of action in response now. We have a lot of making up to do for the time we've lost on a lot of the policy issues we've lost ground. Um, but I think that's being recognized now. And I think we're, we're, it, we're trying to get in front of it. We're trying to get in front of some of the other issues. Well, my biggest concern is, is with the states. So I think DeSantis is actually doing a really great job showcasing how effective a governor, a good leader can be and how effective state legislatures can be when, when they have the right policies in front of them. Now, may, whether, whether you agree with all of his policies or not, I think, it's, I think it's important to just recognize that states have kind of just been sitting on the sidelines in a lot of these cases. They're afraid to go after universities. And it's been for so long, they don't want to take money from the schools. They, it's like the state pride thing, you know, it's like, oh, we, we really want to get box tickets to the sporting games. So legislators just kind of like don't go after them. And when they do pass policies, if you read them closely, you'll find that they don't really have teeth. Oftentimes the policies don't say things like, you will lose funding if you do this. They don't say that. That's like a really easy sentence to write into a bill, but it rarely gets written in because it won't pass. That, that's, a, that's a systematic problem. With, with how states think about their laws against universities. And look, we just talked about, universities respond to two things, the law and money, kind of the law, in that they try to dodge it a lot. But they respond to money more than anything. And when I think of the universities uh, as, as kind of like, we're, some, we're going to battle with them, they're, they're a huge, I mean, they're a huge competitor, they're, they're a huge enemy, I don't wanna say like enemy, because like there are some big universities, but 
They're a behemoth. They have so much money, so many resources, and again, they've been getting away with it for so long, so they have all these policies that you have to, you have to go after. But there's organizations like, and folks like all of us and all of you, who are chipping away at them, right? Chipping away at them slowly. It's gonna take time, we have to be patient. Um, but it's, I, I am optimistic in the end. I do think it's gonna have a good turnout. And if that means they all get burned to the ground, then. <laughs> Uh, I agree, we have to keep fighting, right? I mean, there is, well, let's take it, worst case analysis, we're going to, so, they lost at the Alamo. Socrates lost at his trial. Right? But there's a bigger picture that we have to look at because it's about more than us, right? It's about our country, it's about our future. I'm optimistic because I believe a premise that postmodern study denies. I believe that reality exists, okay? And further, that reality cannot be legislated or spun away forever. It was mentioned that I wrote, uh, or cooperated with the writing of uh, the CRT bill two years ago, um, and I was honored uh, to play a small part in it. I can tell you something, when I looked for a sponsor for that bill in the legislature, because people were asking why doesn't the legislature do anything, it was the last filing day that I found, because it, was it wasn't on the governor's agenda, it wasn't on the lieutenant governor's. So then what happened? How did this bill get passed? The answer was, in the spring of 2021, when the last session was going on, all of a sudden legislators started to hear from parents who were going to school boards, who during the lockdown watched on uh, iPads what was passing for teaching at the schools. That's where this whole thing began. Most legislators don't lead, they follow. Therefore, we must fight. And the final case for the rightness of optimism, Richard Landis wrote a book, The New Wealth and Poverty of Nations, explaining why some countries are poor, others are rich, even though they have the same natural resources. And what he said is this, he said, optimism never fails, right? Not because the optimist is always right, but because he's always optimistic. That's the only way to keep going. Truth matters, so keep up the fight. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you to our great panelists. Let's give them another round of applause. the next couple of years. Well, your YCT experience prepares you for lots of things, whether it's working hard in the workforce or going to politics or being a good parent. Thank you, Dr. Nando. And it's important to remember that the skills and what you learn in YCT can transition into an actual career in politics. When I was in college, one of the things I was most frustrated about was you go to these college organizations, you graduate, you look around, and you're like, well, what's next? And there's nobody there to help you. So I specifically put this panel into our convention so the people in this room who show up and are part of YCT for four years, they do their job and they realize the conservative movement is something I really care about. I really care about the United States of America and I wanna make sure that I do my part to make sure my children and my grandchildren grow up in America that is freer than the one I was born into. Whether that's through school choice, fixing the property tax system, making sure that there isn't a large federal government dictating every single aspect of our lives, whether it's making sure that abortion is permanently banned in the United States in all 50 states, and that we protect life from natural birth till natural death, it is important that our best and brightest get involved in the conservative movement and make a difference. So joining us today, we have Sebastian Quaid with the Bureau, uh, what was it, Bureau of Land, no, it's not Bureau of Land Management, it's General Land Office. We have Jordan Land with the Attorney General's Office. We have Mike Garcia, who is the Chief of Staff for Senator Sparks. We have Spencer, who has a really la weird last name, so I'm not going to try. He's working on the 2025 project with the Heritage Foundation. He'll be happy to tell you more. And then Kyle Bunnell, who puts out a legendary job bank whenever he feels like it, normally twice a week. So if you, need, if you want a job in politics, you need to subscribe to his job bank. So Kyle, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Manfred. Thanks you all for being here. Uh, I'm Kyle Bonnell. I have my career history is really easy to summarize. I worked at Heritage Forever. Uh, so I graduated college, didn't quite know what comes next. So I interned at Heritage, and luckily after several interviews and scrambling, 
I found a one year temporary job doing recruiting and one year wind up becoming 10. Um, so I specialized in helping people find jobs for the last 10 years in the conservative movement. Uh, so Heritage just celebrated its 50th anniversary officially, I believe, last week. And for almost all those years, we've had a job bank. Uh, we know that you know people are policy, and the job bank is the heritage way of putting that into action. Uh, so we help conservatives find jobs in the movement because we know that conservatism can't advance unless you have real conservatives who really care and all the right job that influence policy. Uh, so I've worked on that heritage for the last 10 years. Um, so it's all, it always been about getting conservative jobs. My focus has changed a bit uh, over the years. It used to be staff recruiting, then it was Capitol Hill, then it was the Trump administration, um, and now it's uh, kind of a mix of all those things. Um, I like to joke that I'm like the Forrest Gump of conservative staffing. It's like always stumbling these historical staffing events every couple years, you know, Duncan, Trump, Capitol Hill. I learned quite a bit from that. So I'm always really happy to talk with young conservatives about how to kind of make the jump from a student into actually working the movement because there's just so much opportunity and such a need for more conservatives to work, you know, full time day to day in the movement, you know, all over the country. Thank you all for being here. My name is Spencer Cradian. I am the Associate Director of the 2025 Presidential Transition Project, which is being organized by the Heritage Foundation. And previously, I served as a Special Assistant to President Donald Trump and Associate Director of the Presidential Personnel Office. So all of the political hiring and firing, if you wanted to work for President Trump, that came through our office. And what we're doing now with the 2025 Project is we are building in advance the policies, the people, and the plans that need to be what the next conservative president implements. So whoever the next president is in 2025, we want him or her to have ready uh, the people, the policies, the well-trained people, and the plans so that we don't have happen what has happened <clears throat> to conservative administrations in the past where they're inhibited by the bureaucracy. Um, we are building uh, this project together, and I encourage all of you to go to project2025.org, get involved. If you want to work for the next conservative president, um, this is your opportunity. We want new blood in Washington so that we don't have General Milley and Dr. Fauci exercising the power that they exercise. Amen. Well, I don't know how to follow that. Uh, I'm Mike Garcia, as Manfred said, uh, Senator Kevin Sparks is Chief of Staff. I've, I've been in a whole bunch of different roles uh, in, in my life. I started my career in the Texas legislature. I was probably about most of your old average age. I was about 18 years old when I started. Uh, I played a lot of different roles in between now and then. Uh, most recently, I was the director of the Texas Freedom Caucus in the House. And uh, before then, I uh, served in, in several chief roles in the House as well. So. Uh, looking forward to talking with you all about how to get a job in the legislature if that's what you're interested in doing. Uh, and I'll now pass it to Jordan. Good morning, y'all. Um, my career is not nearly as lengthy. Um, I graduated from UT Austin in December. Uh, I was working part-time at the Attorney General's office. Um, fortunate enough, they liked me enough. They kept me around. Uh, I went full-time in December. Um, and I am a legal strategy analyst, pretty much. I'm not an attorney, but I am full of opinions. So I'm enjoying it a lot. How are you doing? My name is Sebastian Quaid. I, I graduated from Texas State University, and I work at the General Land Office, which controls roughly 13 million acres of public land, uh, oil and gas, and I don't know, just a lot of other things. We're just a catch-all agency. Sort of next question. Uh, Jordan Hall, Texas Freedom Caucus. Our next question is going to be for the employers on this panel. Can each of you explain how hiring works in your specific sphere? So for Kyle, DC, Spencer, White House, and Mike, the Texas legislature. Sure, uh, so in DC, I work quite a bit on staffing for Capitol Hill and for a lot of nonprofit groups in the movement. Uh, so Capitol Hill, the hiring, works for, moves very quickly. So typically they make an offer, they want you to start yesterday. Uh, so if you want to work on Capitol Hill in DC, I hope you do, because we need you there. Uh, you have to be close to graduation, ready to move to D.C. Um, as you pursue those jobs, because it's usually a very quick turnaround. And a lot of employers in the conservative movement aren't big enough just to hire good people as they meet them. And the jobs don't always magically appear right at graduation time. Um, 
So if you're looking to work for a nonprofit group, your timeline is maybe two, three months from, from interview to offer to waiting to start. So now's a good time to start applying for those jobs if you're graduating in May. If you want to, want to work on Capitol Hill, uh, you want to try your best to get yourself moved to DC physically so you can start quickly because there's an immediacy bias. Um, and just try to get yourself networked on Capitol Hill and just be aware that you're not going to get that job lined up a month out. It's going to happen you know, very quickly. Um, for jobs on the Hill, most of them never get publicized. It's usually word of mouth. Uh, so obviously let me know if you go to the Hill. I'm happy to uh, keep an eye out for those openings for all of you. Uh, for jobs with the nonprofits, those usually get publicized. Usually they wind up on the serves, so I'm happy to add you to mine so you see those openings as they come up. And for those jobs, you always want to apply formally. Uh, go online and write a thoughtful application, uh, but tell them you know, why you're conservative, make sure they know you are. Um, and for any job you pursue in DC and the movement, uh, you want to apply formally as you're instructed to do, and then always deploy your references. Uh, people you worked with in the past, close connections, um, who know someone in the different, the different employers, um, always try to activate proactive references to get your application noticed. Because uh, a lot of the hiring movement kind of runs on trust, and then people want to hire known entities who are vouched for. Sure, so if you want to work for the president, I think it's helpful to visualize what the federal bureaucracy is. Um, we always complain about it as conservatives, but the reality is there are 2.2 million full-time non-military federal employees. There are 16 million approximately federal contractors who actually do a lot of the work. And then atop those people, you have between 3,000 and 4,000 political appointees. These are people who can be hired and fired by the president and actually serve at the pleasure of the president. And those few thousand people have to manage and exercise control over the rest of the bureaucracy. Um, the way that the hiring process works for those appointments is through the Office of Presidential Personnel, which works very closely with White House liaisons at each federal agency. Um, so the types of questions that you get asked, the types of um, qualifications that you have to have for those political appointments to work for the next president are very different from the normal uh, federal hiring process. And ultimately, what you have to remember is that ideology and alignment with the president, loyalty to the president, those are the most important things. Um, if you are smart and competent and uh, have the right values, which everybody in this room does, you're gonna, be, you're gonna learn how to navigate the rest of the bureaucracy. Um, so the most important thing is that you, uh, you network with other conservatives and that you, um, you, know, you have the right values and you're willing to put in hard work uh, on behalf of the next president. Yeah, so the hiring process in the legislature uh, probably varies. I, I know it varies uh, a lot. Uh, in our office, we have a, we have a list of things that, that we go through. The first question being, you know, is there a need for, for the hiring, right? Uh, because as much as we love you guys, the government doesn't exist to give you jobs, right? So <laughs> uh, we, we need to make sure there's a need uh, before. And, you know, most of my career has been in the House where the House, House budgets are, are, are a lot less than Senate budgets. And now in the Senate we have a whole big pot of money, and, uh, but, but we're still going to be fiscally conservative about it. And we're not going to spend it all if there's not a need to spend it all. So, uh, you know, if you're looking for a job, you, you might want to be asking around who, who needs a particular type of skill, right? Not, not necessarily who needs a job, who, who needs somebody on staff, but but who needs a communications person? So schedule would be the, the the thing that you want to do at the end of your career, but but you kind of got to put in uh, the grunt work, I guess, if, if, if you're starting out, right? I've done it. Everybody's done it, right? You got to do it. Um, but then, you know, the next question, if there is a need, the next question is: Is there a need? Is there somebody all, all currently on staff that can that can do the job, right? If the answer is no, then we'll move on to. To looking for somebody, and, and I'll tell you, uh, in our office in particular, and this might be a little bit different than, than some other offices, but we value integrity much more than experience, uh, especially when we're looking at, at young folks like, like you. If, if you have loads of experience, but you have a bad reputation around the Capitol building, 
It's probably not somebody that we want to have on staff. So, you know, I, I think I think you all, like uh, uh, Spencer said here, probably all have the right values uh, since you're here. But you know, re remember that that integrity part is, is very important, especially I suspect not just the Capitol building, but in Washington as well. Maybe less so in Washington than, uh, than in Texas. <laughs> uh, so you know, keep that in mind. And then our next question will go to Jordan and Sebs. How did you first get involved in YCT? During my time, I've noticed that no one ever seems to have a normal story. And how did YCT prepare you for being active in the conservative movement? I guess I'll start. Um, I was a student at the University of Texas, and um, I was in my government class. And Wendy Riley, uh, she's a very well-known liberal um, in Austin, came to speak. And she was talking about free college, free healthcare, all the usual free things. And I was just really discouraged by how excited all of my peers were for this liberal candidate. Um, I grew up in a fairly conservative household, but we never really talked politics. Um, and I was just disgusted. I was like, Wendy Riley cannot win. Um, so I immediately reached out to her competitor, uh, which happened to be Congressman Chip Roy at the time, um, and volunteered to block walk. And I had never blocked walk before. I had sold Girl Scout cookies. Same kind of idea, knocking on the door, uh, except for no one wants to buy your cookies and talk to you. Um, and I loved it. Uh, it was great talking politics with people. It was great getting involved. And one of the people on the Chip Roy campaign also happened to go to UT. Um, and told me about YCT and was like, pretty much, if you're tired of the libs, uh, we have a great community here. Um, and then ever since, I've had just different opportunities through Kyle, um, through the Heritage Foundation, and each opportunity has seemed to open up doors elsewhere. Um, and that just keeps propelling me forward. There was a second question. So I was a freshman at Texas State in 2015. Uh, I don't know if y'all remember, there was a pretty heated presidential debate or presidential race going on around that time. Uh, being at Texas State, I knew I was outnumbered by being conservative. And one day this guy in short shorts and tevas came up to me with a beach ball and said, write whatever you want on this. So I wrote a curse word, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and he said, hey, have you heard of YCT? You should come to our meeting and join. You're just the person we're looking for. <laughs> So that's how I kind of got involved. Uh, from there, I just made a bunch of friends, uh, worked my way up, became chairman. And actually, this is the first year since I joined YCT that I'm not a board member. So, congrats. I'm now an alumni. <laughs> so, the next question will be for our employers What is the number one mistake that conservative applicants make? And how can conservative applicants distinguish themselves? Uh, my twin brother works in the Hill for Congress and Chip Roy, and he notes that wingers, people like us, are outnumbered about 10 to 1 on congressional staffs. So a winger is someone like us who show up at YCT, they are hardcore conservatives. The other side is your moderate, squishy, well, I'm a Republican, but like, do we really need to like secure the border, ban abortion, lower taxes, and actually do what we said we would do to get elected? No. I oh, love that question. Uh, so a real common mistake I see is people downplay their conservative experience and their credentials and affiliations when they apply for jobs. Um, and your mindset when you apply for a job should be to think about it through the employer's perspective. Uh, what would a really conservative congressman or think tank want to see on my resume? Uh, what are they gonna find most compelling and then work backwards? So by virtue of being at a YCT convention, you have a conservative affiliation. Um, make that really prominent on your resume when you apply for these jobs. Employers, uh, it's true they really don't um, care about how much you know until they know how much you care. So make sure it's very clear that you're conservative, even if you uh, haven't worked in politics before. Because again, by virtue of YCT, you have that credential. Make sure it's on your resume. And when you apply for jobs, don't just apply and hope for the best. Apply and be proactive about getting people to recommend you, about figuring out who you know who knows to blame in office, and being very diligent and proactive with your networking. I think there are two problems. One is uh, we, we have a general problem um, as conservatives of uh, selling ourselves short and thinking, you know, I could never do that. I could never move to D.C. and work for the president. And I want small government, so why should I even work for the government, right? 
Um, so that's something that, that needs to be avoided. And the other thing is, um, what happens is we see people, uh, when they go into a conservative presidential administration, they kind of lose the forest for the trees and they, um, they, you know, they get captured by the very nice uh, career federal employees who have their own agenda and they, um, you know, they get, they become involved in the minutia of every single detail at their agency instead of remembering how are you going to use all of those uh, tools to actually get the president's agenda done that we voted for. Um, so yeah, but don't don't sell yourself short or think that you uh, don't have the the right experience or that uh, the the working for the president is something that's impossible because it's not. I did it. I think the number one mistake I see applicants make is not knowing exactly what they believe when they come to the interview table. Uh, I'll I'll give you all a a secret. If you ever want to get hired in our office because there's a very fundamental question that we ask. We start all interviews with this question. Uh, what is the proper role of government, right? If you can't answer that question correctly, then you probably have no business working for the government, especially in a conservative office. So I would encourage all of y'all to, you know, everybody gets involved for different reasons, right? Uh, but, but that is a very important question that is underlies almost everything that, that that you do in this organization. So have have a good answer for that. And, uh, and you know, the proper answer, the right answer is government exists to secure your liberties. Uh, and, and that's about it. So uh, also, you know, a few of these guys touched on this, be sincere. Uh, folks can, good people who are the people that you're gonna be applying with uh, can sense when you're not sincere right away. Right, it's it's okay if you don't know the answer to a question. Don't try to lie. Right, we can usually tell if you're trying to lie or or uh, or, or at least you know exaggerate a little bit. And and lastly, this is a this is a mistake I made a, a lot in my early career. For some reason, I thought it was inappropriate for me to use the connections I had made to to look for a job. I, I thought that maybe that would be crossing a, a boundary that that you shouldn't cross or taking advantage of a relationship in a way that you shouldn't take advantage of it. Uh, and I was, I was wrong, right? We, in the conservative movement, we need to take advantage of those connections and, and, and the good people in this room in order to help each other to, to get to places where, where we can have a good effect on policy. So that's my advice. Thank you, Mike. And uh, we'll skip over the fact Mike was in CRs when he was in college. So the next question. <laughs> hey, can I, tell, can I tell my YCT story, how I found out about YCT? Yeah. Can you cut the camera? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was a CR, and, but but it's it's because the first person I ever met at, at UT Austin, his name was a t uh, Tony McDonald. Y'all know Tony, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and he was blasting Rush Limbaugh out on, on the West Mall, and uh, I went up to him. I said, "What's this organization about?" And he said, "We're against minimum wage." And I just wasn't that woke yet. Uh, uh, woke how it used to be. Woke used to mean conservative, right? I think. Uh, and now it means now it means uh, liberal. But I, I just wasn't, I wasn't on that level yet. So I joined CRs, it took me a while to like you guys, but, but uh, now I like you a lot more. It's okay, my graphs are hard. So with that, um, this is now the fifth time Mike has spoken at a YCT event, so he now gets honorary YCT membership to forgive him for his CR participation in undergrad. <laughs> So our next question is for Jordan and Sebastian. First, why should a student consider a career move in politics? Second, what piece of advice do you have for somebody thinking about a career in politics? I think if you're passionate, you should. I really don't have any other answer besides that. It's not something you just kind of half-heartedly get into. Uh, my piece of advice from experience, uh, don't run a candidate against Travis McCormick. <laughs> hey Travis, still, I'm still a little bitter, but uh, yeah, that's, keep, keep pushing those uh, connections and just don't quit. Eventually something will happen. Uh, my advice, not just for people, I'll say, sorry, I said, warned you I'd do this, for women in politics, 
um, is to be unapologetic for your presence. Um, imposter syndrome is a very real thing. Um, most rooms that I'm in are 90% men. Um, not just imposter syndrome in regards to your gender, but also your age. Um, quite often I'm the youngest there, and it can be intimidating. Um, I still feel that, and I got to power through that. Um, so know that you are worthy of being there, and you are worthy of being taken seriously. Um, and I'd also recommend most women read the book Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. Um, she has a famous quote. It's, fortune does favor the bold, and you'll never know what you're capable of if you don't try. Um, in politics, boldness usually pays off. Um, and I recommend all women be assertive, not aggressive with assertive their careers. And Jordan, what do you say when you feel like um, you're trying to apologize too much? You are worthy of being here. You are worthy. No, we don't apologize and protect male egos. There we go. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> so our next question for our employers, how do you find a mentor in politics? A lot of, I've had a lot of mentors over the years, and you know, if, if you you're too legalistic about it, and you try to in your mind define what a mentor is and try to find one, I think that's just too contrived of a way to, to find a mentor. A, a mentor is anybody who's just a little bit uh, ahead of, of you in career-wise that, that you can get advice from. Uh, you know, I do have a token few that that uh, you know former bosses and those types of folks that, that uh, I, I definitely put at the top of, of my mentor list, but just making the connections, you know, I, I could be a mentor to, to one of y'all, Jordan could be a mentor, right, even though she's probably not that much uh, older, older than, than y'all, uh, it, it's, it's, it's all about seeking out somebody with more experience than you so that they can tell you the mistakes they made and you don't have to make those same mistakes. and. Uh, and in, 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 in getting any type of career advice that they can get, right? It's, 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 it's not, uh, I, I, again, I used to think of it as, as a, well, it needs to be somebody who's really famous, or it needs to be somebody who wrote a book, or it needs to be somebody that I can reference, and, and that's just the wrong mentality. Uh, but both people are interesting people. Uh, don't get me wrong, I and mean, you should seek out that type of mentorship, but don't uh, relegate your, your mentors to, to those types of people. Yeah, I would just say the one thing in politics is that everybody feels like they have the best things to say. That's sort of what the, what the nature of it is. So if you seek people out and ask uh, for their advice, their mentorship, um, you know, that is, uh, that's always a good thing. The other uh, thing specific to working in a presidential administration is, you know, most of the uh, particular positions uh, have been held before by someone else uh, in, in, in a conservative administration, and so seeking out, um, you know, seeking out that that person for advice is always uh, always helpful. But yeah, just just ask, and most people are very open to it, um, and and they they like knowing that you admire them. It's really about being proactive. Um, so, just from experience, at a lot of conferences where we do career talks. And this is true of my colleagues too. We'll give out business cards, we'll encourage everybody to follow up with us and maybe get two or three emails after a conference. Uh, so you want to be the person who actually follows up and emails people. Because you don't really have to look very far to find a mentor in the conservative movement because it's usually being offered pretty explicitly and pretty often. Uh, so if you're the person who follows up, emails people, keeps in touch, uh, you'll find a mentor pretty quickly. Uh, so really it's just about kind of taking advantage of a lot of resources, a lot of people who are um, put in place just to help you know, conservatives advance in their careers. Um, so it really is about being the person who follows through and not the 95% people who don't. Um, and for, you'll figure out after you talk to people informationally and who gives good advice, who's responsive, and you'll naturally probably develop a rapport and trust. But it really is just about being proactive and following up with people. And our next question is for Sebs and Jordan. What do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> Still a couple years away. Um, that frontal cortex is coming in hot, buddy. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, you know, keep having this dream that I eventually run for something, but I kind of like where I'm at right now. And uh, this is the first time since graduating college I actually have a desk that I get to sit at every day. And uh, I'm not, I'm not sure I want to give that up anytime soon. 
I will be attending law school in the fall, and that's about as far as I have thought it out. Probably a lie, but okay. <laughs> now, for our employers on the panel, I don't have a political science degree. Can I still work in politics? Yes, and please do. Uh, it's a big myth I love to dispel is that it's all poli sci majors. Uh, the conservative movement needs all kinds of majors. Um, you see this on Capitol Hill, and nonprofits, and executive branch. We need people with business backgrounds who know how to do marketing. Conservatives are not always great at messaging. I need people who know how to do accounting and finance who can analyze a budget. We need people who can do graphic design. We need people who, um, we need lots of attorneys because every policy fight ends in a legal battle. Um, my one favorite challenge is for people to give me an obscure college major and I can tell them how it fits, in, fits in, into the conservative movement. Because really every major can be utilized in some kind of job in the movement um, at some point. Um, you know, throughout their careers. So there's no major that can't find a home in the movement, and usually they can find one pretty quickly. Um, and beyond the major, it's more about skills. So if you can write, if you can do critical thinking, if you have good aptitude, you can find a home pretty quickly. Yeah, I would echo everything Kyle said and just uh, reiterate his point on writing. Uh, if you are able to write well, that is invaluable in politics because there will be times when you want to challenge your boss on something and that can be very intimidating to do but if you can edit something and say there needs to be a comma here and explain why to your boss they appreciate that and they will ask you to start reviewing everything and you will make yourself indispensable so the one uh, piece of advice I have uh, is, is be a good writer and it is astonishing the number of people in Washington DC who hold very high positions who cannot write a paragraph yeah, I think the point's been made that you don't need a government degree or a political science degree to, to work within government. In fact, uh, so I'm not going to make that point. Uh, the point I am going to make, and, and as a government major and as a government teacher, I, I, I teach a few uh, legal classes on the side, is that government is probably one of the only majors that you can major in that does not make you smarter than everybody else in the world of politics just because you have a government degree. There's nothing more annoying than somebody you know, I'm interviewing and they say, well, I, I majored in government, so therefore I know more about politics than everybody. And it's like, no, you're the exact type of person I don't want to work in the office. Uh, and, and I can't say, I love talking about political philosophy, and I wish we talked about that more in the Capitol building, but most of my government training has, does not translate at all into anything I do in, in my day-to-day -day, uh, life at the Capitol. And then our final question for the panel, this is for all five of you. What do you wish you knew as a freshman that you now know, and what would you tell the freshman in this room? So I wish I had known the importance of being engaged in building community. I uh, wish I had gotten started on that earlier. I really didn't start building that until I already graduated and kind of like dropped into the Heritage Foundation. Um, shameless plug, come to Heritage and intern, a good community there. Um, but obviously you guys have this inclination by virtue of being here today, but keep leaning into community. Uh, it's good to meet people who are more senior than you are, who you hire, but don't discount the value of a peer network. Um, it can really sustain you throughout a career, and if you work in the movement, uh, you guys will be working together in different capacities, different jobs for a long time. Uh, so the sooner you start building your community and investing and spending time with more conservatives, uh, the better it'll be for your career and frankly probably your life as well. I wish I'd known that there were people in high places who agreed with me and who cared about me. Um, being, I know what it's like to be a conservative on a college campus, we all do. Uh, I know what it's like to be a conservative alone on a college campus and um, uh, you know, keep up the faith, keep up the fight. If you're here, that means you're committed. Um, so just know that uh, if there's, you're, you're not going to be on campus forever and in five or ten years um, you know, you're, you're going to be in positions of power that your, your liberal colleagues on, on campus can only dream of. I wish that somebody had sat down and demonstrated to me when I was a freshman how incredibly easy it is to become an expert at a very, on, on a very niche subject and, and therefore also becoming invaluable, like, like the writing skill. Well, if, you, if you're one of the few people in the state that know about, uh, well, I'll talk about the Disaster Act, uh, for example. I, I wrote a law review article on the Disaster Act a few years back, and it hadn't been researched hardly at all. 
And uh, a lot of the research that, that myself and, and some of the people that helped me uh, that really helped kind of translate to some of the stuff going on now. So, and, and that was just because we sat down and, and, and studied it. And there's a lot of issues like that that are very important that a lot of people just don't know about that will be very easy for any one of y'all, no matter what your age is or experience level, to, to become a quasi-expert on and, and, uh, and use that for your advantage in your career. I wish as a freshman I had known that the Texas Ledge is ran by 20-year-olds um, and Congress is staffed with 25-year-olds. Um, so you're truly never too uh, young to start getting involved. Just how much Manfred helps connect everybody. Uh, I mean, kind of going back to the mentor question, there's so many people in this room that I didn't know before I talked to Manfred, uh, and they have just made my life so much easier. I mean, Mike got me my first job. Travis taught me how to lose. <laughs> gracefully, gracefully. Well, uh, I mean, and then we got Greg and Donna Davidson in the bank. When I left law school, Donna was there, and I talked to her maybe twice before that. And, I, you know, the, the age separation kind of melts after you leave college, and I kind of consider these people friends at this point. I hope they do too as well. But, but yeah, but thank you. Can we get a round of applause for our work? Before we dismiss, I'd like to thank Kyle and Spencer for everything you've done to help support the students in this room and the alumni who moved on. Thank you for Heritage's dedication to YCT being a successful organization. Mike, thank you for helping me through all those times where we're trying to place people who needed jobs, who needed internships. You're always there for a late night phone call. We've got to get somebody plugged in. I really appreciate all the careers you guys have helped start. And Jordan, Sebs. It honestly makes me feel old when I started that. as executive director of the foundation. I was 21 years old because nobody checked my ID. And it, it hurts a little bit, but I also feel very content knowing that there are people that have made a difference in this room and on this stage with who are going out into the world and making a big difference and are staying true to YCT's values, who supported this organization and are going out and make a difference in the world. So thank you guys all for being here. If you're hungry, raise your hand. All right, so lunch is exactly where breakfast was. Stand up, walk straight that way, because we've got to start our lunch keynote. I also have to run over there, because I'm running it. Lunch is buffet style, by the way, so just go in, get a plate, grab some food, and sit down. Everything except for the soup, the soup the staff will help serve you. Thank you, guys. But that's the question, uh, because it's one of the largest false narratives that are out there. But make no mistake, it's done by design. They want to make everything that's happened in our Southwest order actually about immigration. They want, uh, they want to erase, for example, illegal immigration from the narrative. They don't want to talk about border security. They don't want to talk about national security. They want to talk about everything that's happened on the Southwest border in terms of immigration. Why? Well, because if you're against what's happening at the southwest border in terms of immigration, then that must mean you're against immigration. If you're against immigration, you know what's coming next. You're against brown people. If you're against brown people, you're a racist, right? That's what happens. And they're, they're winning that narrative. But this is done by design. And this is what's so important that, that as, as young people, you, you've got to go, I, I'm respectfully saying it, You've got to be educated. You've got to make yourself aware. I was just uh, watching an interview of, of a young woman the other day, and she said she was having a philosophical debate about some issue. And, and it, it went really quickly from zero to 60 to the other person calling her a racist. And she said she was shocked. She, she was stunned, it, and she took a step back, and she said she didn't know how to react, and so she kind of shut down. Guess what? They won. That's exactly what they want. They want to shut you down. They want to continue the false narrative. Let me give you a couple of facts that why what's happening on the southwest border is about border security, which is synonymous with national security. Here's how this goes. Illegal aliens come to the United States the last 25 months, almost 6 million. 6 million. 
There's no country on the face of the planet that can sustain, sustain that, not even the greatest country in the face of the planet that we live in the United States. The reality of what happens is when you have invasion level numbers like that, the most we've ever had in our lifetime, it's not another surge, trust me. It's the worst we've ever seen in our history. What happens is that pulls uh, agents and other officers off the front line away from the national security mission. It relegates them to administrative duties, to hospital watch, transportation, and processing illegal aliens, and then release in the United States. What that results in is in some areas, large areas along the southwest border, 80 to 90 percent of border patrol agents are not on the front line. They're not secure in our country. They're not protected under national security. We have literally, in the past 25 months, handed operational control of our southern border over to the cartels for them to exploit. And what are the results of that? I'll give you one data point. 1.3 million known Godaways. Known Godaways is an illegal alien who has come across our border and invaded apprehension. Why? Because there's not a border patrol agent out there to apprehend them. And that's the known Godaways. If you ask the border patrol agent that's on the front line, they'll say that number is usually twice as high. Why is that important? Well, think about it. If the majority of illegal aliens come across, this is what happens, they literally walk across, even though the White House press secretary said to a reporter, well, it's not like they actually just walk across the border. Yeah, that's exactly what they do every single day. And the majority, when they walk across the border illegally, they sit down. They literally will sit down and wait for a border patrol agent. Why? Because they know they're going to be processed and released under this administration. So why wouldn't we have a guideway? Why would there be a guideway? If, if, if right now in this administration you could walk across our border and literally sit down and be processed and released, which is exactly what they want, why are people trying to fight, run, and hide to get away? Criminals. Because the reality is, even though if you say this, you're, you're called a racist, right? You're saying you're hyperbolic. When you say that not everybody coming across our border are good people, did I say they're all bad people? No, but they're not all good people. Let me give you a stat. The same 25 months, uh, CBP has apprehended 72,000 criminals. That's what they've apprehended. And this isn't a slight to them. Some of that's just by accident. They just stumbled upon them, right? Because they're, they're not out there. 72,000 guidelines. Let me give you a couple other stats within that. Okay? I mean, 72,000 criminals, including 120 convicted murderers among the 72,000. Convicted murderers. Thousands of gang members and those have been convicted of sexual assault, including pedophilia and rape, and that goes on and on and on. So let's get back to the 1.3 million Godaways. How many murders, rapists, pedophiles, aggravated felons, and gang members are among the 1.3 million known Godaways that now call the United States home? Yeah, this isn't about immigration. This is about border security. Let me give you another stat from Texas. You're from Texas. How many of you heard this stat? From 2011 to 2022. 261,000 illegal aliens committed 433,000 crimes, including 800 homicides, 800 kidnappings, and 5,000 sexual assaults. You know what the mic drop is? State of Texas alone. So don't tell me that our borders are secure. Don't tell me that this is about immigration. This is about border security. Let me give you another stat. In the same 25 months, there have been over 160 illegal aliens encountered on the FBI's terror screening database. Think about that. This isn't hyperbolic to say, look at the 1.3 million known Godaways. How many individuals are now in the United States that are on the FBI's terror screening database? The answer is, even though Secretary Marcus won't tell and be honest with the American people, we have no freaking idea how many. But here is what is honest, is we can have the next terrorist sleeper cell already in the United States plan the next terrorist attack, and we have a no idea. That's the reality. And that's why we say this is not about immigration. This is about border security, which is synonymous with national security. And so when you're at your next party, your next engagement, and somebody tries to tell you and make the case that this is about immigration, you have a little more data now to call BS and say that's simply not true. And one last thing, then, and we can go on to the next question. Sorry, security. Against the policies happening right now that's opened up our borders, that's also for legal immigration all day long, every day, right? Our God, our country is uh, you know, built on immigration, but it was built on legal immigration. Those who valued the rule of the law, those who valued the sovereignty of the nation, those who looked forward to assimilating and becoming United States citizens. That I am for all day long. I'm against what's happening right now.
that's such an important <laughs> issue. Thank you. Your employer at the Heritage Foundation is known for being a leader in the conservative movement, especially in the president, Dr. Kevin Roberts. Part of leading the movement includes building a coalition of other conservative groups to prioritize securing the southern border, especially now that the House of Representatives will hopefully be more open to secure border policies. Can you talk about those priorities and how it'll help actually secure the border? Yeah, so that's a question. We were just talking about that later, right? About that, about coalition. There's another thing I can leave you. Look, wherever you go, um, getting folks together across um, uh, not just the aisle, but within the conservative movement is very important, right? There, there, are, there are several conservative think tanks that, that are based in the states, based in D.C. I do believe we're strong together. Heritage has taken a leading role in that. But before I, I get to that and I talk about this letter, I, I've got to call balls and strikes, right? Because we know what we need to do. And part of it is, look, I know this sounds kind of tongue-in-cheek. I don't mean it this way. It's just reality because I was there. I was the Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection under uh, President Trump, and our responsibility was to secure our borders. I'm very proud that I oversaw the completion of 460 miles of wall system being built, uh, which secured our borders. First of all, I, I know, look, I, I know this is straightforward, but, but I have to say it's because it's not being done right now. How about we start with just enforcing the laws already in the books, right? Let's just start there, shocker. But I'm telling you, that's not being done right now. The laws on the books right now are not being forced, enforced by this administration or this secretary. That's just full stop. So let's start there. But then we also have to have a system. That, that enforces the rule of law, protects our sovereignty as our nation, and we have to have policies that are in place that deter, apply consequences to those who violate the law, and put integrity back in the system by reducing and eliminating the abuse of our asylum system. So let's talk about right there. And we also need a couple of multi-layer strategies, not one or the other. We need resources plus policy. And I'm gonna really emphasize the policy because from, from the change of the, the, the Trump administration, the Biden administration, guess what didn't change? Resources. You have virtually the same amount of resources, except it's not building a wall. But, but for all intents and purposes, the resources didn't change. But yet all of a sudden, overnight, boom, the, the illegal Asian skyrocketed up. Our border became less secure literally overnight. They literally took the most secure border in our lifetime. And they took the network of tools, authorities, and policy we had, and they dismounted it overnight. And that's what drove this invasion level of illegal aliens we've seen uh, so far that, that has made our borders less secure. What changed? Policy. So this is about Congress acting to pass meaningful legislation to address the loopholes, to codify stuff that we did. So part of it, though, is we're waiting for Congress to act. What we could do if we had the right individual in the White House, what I would respectfully recommend is reach on the shelf, pull off the Trump era playbook on border security, dust it off, and implement it. Right? And you're you're about 85% there. I can tell you just a couple of months. So the, the ACAs, the Sodom Cooperative Agreements, or the Safe Third Countries, which says that if you're a, a migrant traveling through a country, you should seek relief in the first country that can provide that relief to you, that first safe third country. That's an international standard. It's common sense. Why would you, why would you incentivize and encourage a migrant that's seeking legitimate a, a, a relief from where they're at? Why would you direct them and have them put their lives and their livelihood in the hands of the cartels if they track thousands of miles to the United States? It's stupid. It doesn't it make sense. It defies common sense. What we should be doing as a country, as a world, is that getting them relief in the first safe third country they come to. That's what the ACAs with all three northern trunk of countries did. The other thing we did to, to apply consequences and reduce asylum fraud, because no matter how many times the mainstream media or this administration says it, it doesn't make it true. The overwhelming majority of migrants that are coming are economic migrants. That is not a valid asylum claim. Now look, we can have compassion for them. I get it. And maybe if I was them and I wanted to climb the economic ladder, I'd want to come to the United States as well. But it's not the law. Nor is it the international standard. Nor can the United States take in anybody from 195 different countries from all over the world. Other countries should and must stand up and share that burden. But right now, 
Asylum claims for those that are fleeing persecution because of their involvement in protected class, that's a legitimate asylum claim. If you have that, yeah, come on in. But that's not what's happening. Over 90% do not get relief that file asylum claims. So we know that they are fraudulently uh, uh, um, applying asylum. So the Remain in Mexico program worked. By February of 2020, we reduced illegal immigration by 85%. 85%. And that equated to more agents back on the line, back on the national security mission. That, that allowed us to stop more drugs, stop more criminals, stop more national security threats. So what we need to do is we need to have a set of policies that, that address deterrence, consequences, and put integrity back in the system by reducing asylum fraud. And as, as uh, Manfred mentioned, the Heritage Foundation, a very proud that they led the way of a coalition effort. And, and I encourage you, you can find this on their website. It's a coalition letter that we put out a few months ago. And there's about a dozen conservative think tanks that got together and they wrote this letter. It's very simple, very concise, and provided Congress with a roadmap of here's some of the things that you need to do. If you do this, you're gonna reduce illegal immigration, which is gonna allow our borders to be more secure and more Americans are gonna live and more migrants are gonna live as well because of it. And a couple of things that they did in there is they made the case of that you need resources. So yes, you need more personnel, you need more technology, you need more infrastructure, i.e. the wall, but you also need policies. You need policies like the Remain in Mexico program. You need policies that are gonna address the abuse and the credible fear of the asylum process. You need to overturn USB Arizona that doesn't allow states to actually enforce immigration law and more effectively secure their borders. And the list goes on and on. I promise you, if Congress would act and pass legislation that addressed the elements in this coalition letter, I promise you, illegal immigration would stop. We'd be able to improve legal immigration and our borders would be more secure. Hey, here's another thing too, I forgot to mention another question, um, is that, so we talked about criminals, we talked about national security threats, we forgot to talk about drugs, right? I mean, it's just, it's incredulous to me. You know, we hear about, we hear about fentanyl poisoning, in, in your communities. But how many times in local news do you hear that when you hear about a fentanyl poisoning, but then the next sentence is, oh, by the way, fentanyl came from the southwest border. It doesn't happen. It's like, it's like somehow, magically, fairy dust is, is you know, put out through the entire United States and somehow fentanyl is dropped. No, it comes from the southwest border. Precursor chemicals are shipped from China to Mexico where they manufacture uh, fentanyl and synthetic drugs. They're pushing across the border. It doesn't stay at the border. It makes the way to every town, city, and state. I promise you, if you know or hear of fentanyl poisoning, that fentanyl came from the southwest border. In a 12-month period, 107,000 Americans died from drug uh, uh, overdose and fentanyl poisoning. And, and we know that 9,000 Americans are dying every single day because of drug coming across our southwest border. Yet this secretary says our borders are secure. It's all a lie. So we've got to have it. And the, the last thing that I'll say about the policy is I, I've got to call balls and strikes. So what, what I think we could do is the president, right now through executive order, could reinstate the asylum cooperative groups, could reinstate the safe third country, I mean the, uh, the Remain in Mexico program. He could remove the uh, ICE interior enforcement requirements that prohibits ICE from doing their job to deport people that are here illegally. He could do that all with the stroke of a pen. By doing that, he would reduce illegal immigration by about 80% overnight while they're waiting for Congress to act. But the last thing that I'll say is keep in mind, keep in mind, this, isn't, this is where this doesn't just become a Democratic issue. President Trump, the Republicans, had the White House, the House, and the Senate for the first two years. Remember that? Guess how, guess how many meaningful pieces of legislation they passed with respect to border security those two years? Zero. 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 And right now, right now, the Republicans have retaken the House and as we have this devastation going on on our southwest border, they, they, they've complained about it for two years. They ran on this. And they won the House on border security in part. Yet so far, there hasn't been a single piece of border security legislation that's made it to the floor for a vote. Even though Chip Roy, right here in Texas, H.R. 29, has an effective border security bill out there. It's not perfect. I don't think it goes far enough. But it's going to stop the bleeding. It's a damn good start. We have said three Republicans that are blocking it from making it to the floor, including Tony Gonzalez right here in Texas. And I've got to tell you, Tony Gonzalez, I'm telling you right now, if I hurt your feelings, you know, uh, 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 
uh, sorry, but not sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry, not. <laughs> what? Don't worry about you know, So, so I, I, here, here's what I'm frustrated about Tony. Not that this is a disagreement. Hey, that's that's what that's where our country's founded on. He's lying. He's lying to the American people about what HR 29 is and isn't. He says that it prevents asylum. That's not true. It just forces individuals to actually apply. Uh, uh, actual asylum claims, and then as you're waiting for your asylum claim, to either remain in Mexico or be detained as you go through your process. Because once you're released and you're you're filing to have an invalid claim, we know they never relieve. That's the truth. So the the frustration for me now is is that we we blame the Democrats as we should for creating the crisis, but now there's blame on the Republicans right now because they've an opportunity to try to solve the crisis as well. Thank you. The board is being created at the federal level has a lot of what could and should and can't, but we all know that with divided government, it's unlikely that board security will be passed uh, during this Congress. But what can the states do, and what should they be looking at doing that's within the confines of the Constitution and the Tenth Amendment that will help make America safer? Yeah, so that. This is a very important question, but it's also a frustrating question because we really shouldn't have to be asking this because securing our borders really is a federal responsibility. It's a no-brainer, right? It's in the Constitution. But clearly, this administration has abdicated their constitutional responsibility. So there's two constitutional clauses, Article 1, Section 10, Article 4, Section 4, that talks about the federal government's responsibility to protect the states from threats outside the states. And then the second clause talks about if the federal government fails to do that, either because of lack of will, courage, uh, or capability, then the states have a self-help remedy. In fact, look, a lot of the states probably wouldn't have ratified the Constitution. I'm not a constitutional scholar, but, but just generally speaking, uh, that, that's the whole premise, is they, they, they got some states to sign on because the states contain and kept some enabling rights, right? They said, look, if you, federal government, cannot protect the states, we should have the right to protect ourselves. And that's in the Constitution. So, for example, in the great state of Texas, that's exactly what Governor Abbott has done. He's availed himself of that constitutional self help remedy and he's declared an invasion. Why is that important? Because U.S. v. Arizona is very clear that it says states cannot enforce federal immigration law. So their hands are tied with what they could do. Operation Lone Star here in Texas, uh, that Governor Abbott has done, and, and uh, the DPS, the Rick McGraw, which is a, is, a, is a friend of mine, hey, from a law enforcement perspective, outstanding. That, that Operation Lone Star has been incredible. They recovered tens of thousands of pounds of drugs, stopping it from getting to communities, 300 to 350,000 illegal aliens, weapons, currency, the list goes on. From a law enforcement perspective, been very, very successful. But the only thing, last two years, what's happened to the border? It's just gotten worse. Why? Because ultimately the hands, the state's hands are tied, they can't enforce immigration law. But when you go to the Constitution and you declare an invasion, that goes away. So now, you're, you're, you're taking action to protect your state, not enforcing federal immigration law. You're actually invoking the constitutional clause to protect your state that allows you to do more. And right now, the debate, and it's, it's a justifiable debate, is here's the one thing that they need to do that every state needs to do. Illegal alien comes across, detain, remove them. Until you remove them, that illegally enter and file a false claim. If you continue to release them in the United States, this is where I would say you don't have to be border security expert and it's not rocket science If you allow them to illegally enter in violation of the rule of law, you allow them to uh, uh, apply for a fraudulent asylum claim and you release them in the United States, they're gonna keep coming. I know, pretty, pretty straightforward, right? So if you deter, apply consequences, reduce fraud, they'll stop coming. History has shown that time and time again. So until the states, which they shouldn't have to do, but because this administration has advocated the responsibilities, until the states detain and remove, you're not going to see a significant movement with respect to the overall encounters and flow coming here. The issue is, is a very real one though, and I think Governor Abbott is concerned about that, as is Steve, is that the issue is that a Texas Trooper National Guards person that actually removes them, they could be sued in their personal capacity. They could be sued and found to be acting outside the scope of their employment. There could even be, they could even be held criminally liable. So they're having a lot of legal scholars walk through that right now. But having said that, 
Here's another, I, I came with props. So here's, here's another little pamphlet that's been put out by Heritage. I really recommend uh, all of you look at it. It's a quick read, uh, it's big, big print. Uh, it'll take you about five minutes. And it walks through 20 things that states can do. And let me just give you a, a couple that are very important. E-Verify, E-Verify. Think about this. The, the, the illegal aliens migrants today are not like the migrants in the past. The, the, the migrants today want five things coming to the country. They, they want to be able to enter illegally, stay illegally, and be free from deportation. They want to work illegally. They want to send money home and bring family members. That's it. Those five things. What, what was missing there? Become a citizen. Become citizen. Amnesty. If you ask a migrant in the United States today, if we give you those five things, those five things, but you'll never, never receive citizenship, you good? 100% will say, yeah, I'm good. Guess what? The Biden administration is right now giving them all five of those things. The only entity that cares about amnesty are the Democrats. And here's why. Sorry, a quick, quick sidebar. Here's why. And, and this was hard for me to get to, but this is the reality. Because there's a perceived political benefit. Two fronts. One is that, remember, illegal aliens are counted as part of the census. So there's a very real redistricting possibility in favor of the Democrats. The second perceived benefit is the Democrats believe that every single illegal alien they find a pathway to citizenship is going to equate to a Democratic vote. Now keep in mind, these aren't my words. So, and you can, you know, obviously probably most of you already heard it, but you can look it up. These are President Biden's words when he said, if you don't vote for me, you're not black. Right? <laughs> Those weren't my words. Those were Biden words. Right? Which is just, and how that's not the, how that's not the biggest racist comment by, that we've heard. But those are his words. So I'm confident you're going to hear the same thing in a couple of years. If you don't vote for me, you're not Hispanic. Right? So keep that in mind. But, so let's get back to what states can do. E-verify. So think about it. One of the big draws is that they come here illegally and then they get to work. If you, if you take that ability away from them to work illegally, you've just checked off another significant deterrence factor. Here's another thing that states could do. The 287G program, right? Which that program allows local law enforcement to actually work with ICE. Shocker, that local law enforcement can actually work with federal law enforcement to work together to find people that are here illegal aliens, especially focusing on those that are criminal illegal aliens, and report them. I mean, remove them, deport them. Making that a law within the state. Another example that you could do is outlaw sanctuary cities within your state. Think about this. Right now, remember those five things. An illegal alien can come, they're going to go to Sanctuary City. They're, look, they're going to New York, they're going to Chicago, they're going to Los Angeles, they're going to DC. Right? Why? Because not only are they shielded and protected from removal because they won't allow uh, local law enforcement to work with federal agencies, but then they're also rewarded. They're allowed to vote in local elections, they're given driver's license, they're allowed to work illegally, the list goes on and on and on. They're actually rewarded for their illegal behavior and their continued illegal behavior. If you remove their ability to be rewarded for their illegal behavior, i.e. deterrence, I promise you the numbers will go down, more agents back on the line, our bill is secure, our border going through. So I know we don't have time to go through all 20, but again, it's a quick read, and the, the, the bottom line is, is, is that there are multiple things that states can do to help address the crisis. Well, thank you for this wonderful conversation. We have one question left, and then Kevin will come up and give us instructions for the rest of the day. So, should the Biden administration be held accountable? And if so, specifically, who and how should they be held accountable? Yes. Um, this is another very important narrative. What, what's happening on our border is not by accident. What's happening on our border is not being driven by incompetence. This is willful and intentional. I can't tell you how many sources have gotten back to me with individuals in the Biden administration and said, you know, when you came on, what, what, was, your, what was your mission? 
What were your marching orders? Two things. One, dismantle everything that had Trump's name attached to it. And two, manage the flow. That's very, very important. So when you hear Secretary Mayorkas and others in the administration say they inherited the dismantled system, it's not spin. Spin is when you take the facts and you talk about those facts in the most favorable light to your position. That's DC spin. That's not what's happening here. What's happening now is a blatant, unadulterated lie. Right? When they say they inherited a dismantled system, uh, here, here's what I ask you. Go through, do your Google research. I, I, it's, it's really a, 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 I'm gonna say dare, quest to, to, when they say, anybody in this administration say they inherited a dismantled system, they never give you an example afterwards. They say they inherited a dismantled system, but they never give you an example of what was dismantled. I can. I'm going to say this administration took the most secure border in our lifetime and they intentionally dismantled it. How did they do that? They stopped the asylum cooperative agreements. We have all three northern triangle countries that ended forum shopping. They ended the Remain in Mexico program that allowed us to reduce illegal immigration by 85% and reduce fraudulent asylum claims. They stopped building the wall, which allowed border patrol agents to actually change and direct the behavior of the cartels rather than the cartels driving our behavior. They gutted ICE. They put restrictions where the only individuals they can remove are known or suspected terrorists. Everybody else gets to stay here and remain here illegally. I could go on and on with what they dismantled. And this was intentional. You have a secretary, which is what I believe we should begin with and impeach him. And this isn't about this isn't about politics, and this isn't about a policy difference. Some of the Republicans still are getting that confused because they're so gun shy with because of the, the unbelievable way that Democrats use impeachment. They did use it for politics and policy difference rather than what it's designed for. So now they're worried that the perception will be the same. They don't need to worry about that. This is the first time in our lifetime that a cabinet level official the size of DHS has actually took his role and said, you know, those laws, yeah, yeah, I know, comes to pass the Constitution, separate but co-equal branches of government, but you know what, nah, I'm just going to decide what laws I want to enforce and which ones I don't. We've never had that before. We've never had a secretary who has come on board and actually directed the personnel, the men and women under his charge to actually violate the laws that they're entrusted and statutory mandated to enforce. We've never had that before. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, have you ever heard this from Secretary Mayorkas? The border's secure, right? At the time that he said that, the time he said that, the first time he said that under oath in, in Congress, uh, that it was uh, uh, in 2021. I believe at that time there had already been 600,000 known Godaways. And again, 1.3. He still says the border is secure. There's no objective, rational, reasonable, honest person that, that could know there's been 1.3 million known Godaways and say the border is secure. It's just a lie. This is also the same secretary that has said that being here illegally or having a court order removal by an immigration judge is not enough to remove you. That's in direct violation of the law. This is the same secretary that says, even though the law says that certain demographics illegal entry must be detained, is not doing that. He's released in the United States. Most aren't vetted properly. We have no idea actually what their background is. I could go on and on and on about the actual laws he's violated and how his legacy will be, he's overseeing the worst catastrophic, unmitigated, intentional border disaster that we've ever seen in our lifetime. So yes, it's time for Congress, for the Republicans to step up and have the political strength, courage, and will to do the right thing and hold people accountable. And here's the last thing I'll say about this. I, I hear this all the time too. Well, ah, Mark, you know, you, we, we do this, listen, we do this, it's gonna go to the Senate, they're never actually gonna impeach him. And you know, if we impeach more up my Arcus, then you know, who knows who they're gonna replace him with, they could just replace him with somebody um, you know, worse. That's not an argument not to hold somebody accountable, right? That's stupid. So, so you've got a guy that's destroyed our border, jeopardized our country's national security, safety, and, and health, and you're gonna say, well, because the Senate may not do their job, or we can get somebody worse, so let's just stay on and continue to destroy our country. That's just ignorant. And the other thing that I'll say about this, what, what the, the impeachment process will also get, is for everybody in this country, for the first time in over two years, you're actually going to hear the truth, 
You're going to hear the reality, and you're going to understand how and why we got here. And it was done by politics instead of what was in the best interest of this country. We're already starting to hear some of this, that the hearings we're having in the House. The judiciary hearing was just held in Yuma, Arizona. Sheriff Wilmot, for example, I know Sheriff Wilmot is a good dude, he's, he's, a, he's a good leader, he's an honest man, and he was asked a question that Secretary Mayorkas has been asked. He said, they, they asked him, they said, Sheriff, is board security? He says, no. Is, when Secretary Mayorkas says the board security, is he telling the truth? No. Yeah, we need more of that. America needs to hear more of that. This isn't supposed to be a heritage show, but these are just things we've worked on. So Heritage just put out a really great legal analysis on why Secretary America should be impeached. It's long, uh, but it's a good read, uh, both from a, a legal analysis, but also an operational perspective as well. And uh, I, I think it's worth a read, so just so you guys know what's out there. Well, thank you for the conversation. We all know the border is a very, very complicated issue. So thank you for coming in and helping make it clear what's going on, what the reality is, and how we can do our part to secure this on the border. And then with that, with that Kevin, time for us to tell us what to do next. Thank you again very much. Okay. Uh, yeah. We will have our YLW coming up next in about 15 minutes uh, in a room right next to us where we were before. Uh, the reception tonight from Halo begins at 6 o'clock. Uh, dinner will be held in this room right after that reception. Uh, and with that, have a great afternoon. With that, I would like to introduce Connie Burton. Connie Burton is founder and CEO of The Texan. Previously, she was a grassroots activist who worked on numerous campaigns for local, state, and federal races. Connie then went on to run for office and was elected in 2014 to serve Tarrant County's Senate District 10 in Austin. Her experience as a grassroots activist, elected official, and taxpaying citizen provides a unique and valuable perspective on the political landscape in Texas. Please join me in welcoming Connie Burger. y'all heard me go, oh, I thought y'all were going to do business things before I spoke, so anyway, thank you, and hello, um, I am Connie Burton, former state senator and now founder and CEO of The Texan, a statewide political news organization. <laughs> I am the media now. <laughs> oh dear. It's quite bizarre, actually. I, I mostly despise politicians, and yet I became one. And I absolutely despise the media, and yet I founded a media organization. Of course, the reason I did both is exactly because of my contempt for them. Neither of them do the jobs they are supposed to anymore, and both have warped what their roles are to such an extent that you can no longer recognize either of those professions. So entering the political and media arenas was not because I wanted to join them, but rather because I wanted to beat them. Beat them by reminding them, by example, to focus on what they're supposed to be focused on. For politicians, that's protecting individuals rights, God-given rights. And for the media, just report the news without pushing left-wing narratives. It's a fight I'll continue. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's great seeing so many familiar faces that I've already spoken to this evening. I hate to start out this way, but I have to say there's a lot of despair in the world today. And it seems to be by design. If you scroll through the dumpster fire that is Twitter, which I love, by the way, <laughs> but it certainly shows there as clear as day, you definitely see just how many people think that in some way, in some fashion, the world is worse off now than it was before. 
That newfound depths of human evil and suffering signal the end of times. The world is teetering on the brink of collapse, and so we must power into a state of limited existence like hermits. Bubble wrap ourselves into isolation. When my daughters were young, they'd come to me and tattle about something ridiculous in hopes to get their sibling or a friend in trouble for something quite insignificant, but wholly terrible in their eyes. After the shrieking would stop, I'd always ask, is there blood? Is there any blood? Can you find any blood? And of course, every time the answer was no. And because there was no blood, I knew that whatever it was they were tattling about was of little significance. So I would then let them know I didn't want to hear another word about it. <laughs> that was to hopefully impart on them some degree of self-sufficiency and awareness that not every perceived perceived problem they faced was worth fretting over, or even a real problem at all. This should be a part of growing up for everyone. We fall, we scrape our knees, someone calls us a silly name, we made a bad grade, the list goes on and on. As we get older, the bumps in the road have greater consequences. And that is exactly why we must be taught early on that not every little thing we deal with is earth-shattering. So that when true troubles do arise, and they will, we have the gumption, the energy, the bandwidth, and the knowledge to work through truly life-altering dilemmas in a productive way that will help us move forward. So many only see what's right in front of their noses at the moment in time. To some extent, that's natural. Thinking beyond today is not how we're wired when we come into this world. It's learned. But to be a functioning adult, just thinking day to day just doesn't cut it. Unfortunately, throughout this country, there are millions of people suffering from delayed adolescence. Former Senator Ben Sass wrote a whole book on this. I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's no secret that America's college campuses are the epicenter of this phenomenon. Young adults who can't even legally drink, who've never balanced a checkbook, although that's not very something many people do anymore, um, who seldom, seldom done any hard labor in their short lives, have in recent years begun mounting coups against their elders, mainly professors who teach things that don't pre precisely toe the line of progressive orthodoxy. Then, these professors are sacrificed to the youthful mob by spineless administrators. One of the first examples of this occurred at Evergreen State College in Washington. Husband and wife professors Brett Weinstein and Heather Hayne, both lifelong Democrats, mind you, were run off of campus for mildly and then vocally criticizing an event that forced white students to leave campus for a day to go and talk about race issues. This event, of course, was all part of an effort to make campus more inclusive racially. It's the biggest bit of irony I've ever heard. Both professors no longer work at Evergreen State. They were banished by the adolescent mob. And guess who made that whole episode worse? The Meek University president. Rather than scold the student troublemakers, he capitulated. In one instance, students demanded he stop using his hands while talking because they felt threatened by it. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> of course, the president complied with this ridiculous snowflake's requests and begged for forgiveness. Forgiveness that, of course, never came. It never does. Nothing is ever good enough for the mob. Professor Weinstein wrote about the university president's strategy for this inclusive event that banished white people from campus in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. He stated, 
quote, the plan and the way it is being forced on the college are both deeply author authoritarian and the attempt to mandate equality of outcome is unwise in the extreme. Equality of outcome is a discredited concept, failing on both logical and historical grounds, as anyone knows who studied the misery of the 20th century. It wouldn't have withstood 20 minutes of reasoned discussion. This presented traditional, independent academic minds with a choice. Accept the plan and let the intellectual descendants of critical race theory dictate the bounds of permissible thought to the sciences and the rest of the college, or insist on discussing the plan's shortcomings and be branded as racist. Most of my colleagues chose the former, and the protesters are in the process of articulating the terms. I dissented and ended up teaching in the park." Unquote. Evergreen State was fertile ground for this nonsense. It had no grading system, and no students had no majors. But it, it has spread beyond these universities. You'd expect nothing less from those that should, show, that should fully know better. Texas universities, universities some of you here attend, are fostering the same garbage. UT Arlington created a rainbow lounge to provide a safe space. UT Austin had a bureau of speech police and only disbanded it after criticism mounted. Texas A&M has been sued over its affirmative action policies that discriminate against white and Asian men. And something I know all of you here are quite familiar with, UNT tried to remove its YCT group because progressive students demanded it. By the way, you can read about all these stories in the Texan. <laughs> Of the roughly 200 universities evaluated in the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education's Free Speech Ranking, not one of Texas's nine large public universities ranked in the top 20. UT El Paso ranked 29th, A&M 40th, UNT 166th, and UT Austin 180th. Some are worse than others, but at every one of these institutions, there will have been some instance of campus progressives trying to shut down those they disagree with. And they do this because they think they can get away with it. And they often do. In many of these places across the country, the inmates run the prison. Honestly, that says more about the supposed adults in the room than adults' cowardice feeds the fire. Like my daughters did, these students need to be told no. And when they're never, when they're not ever told no, during their pampered lives, their arrogance and demands only grow. These students lack perspective and are unfortunate that no adults in their lives have given that to them. Make no mistake, I'm absolutely blaming the adults for these adolescent mobs because it is they who have created these spoiled brats. I'll say it. And now, unfortunately, that petulance has moved off campus and graduated to the real world that we conservatives were so convinced it never reach. Surely, reality would knock some sense into these people. Not so. Now these same activists populate the HR departments of America's corporations and occupy the diversity, equity, and inclusion offices of the state's biggest cities and agencies. And they all operate in their positions with the same level of despair. Like Chicken, like chicken Little, they're all convinced that the sky is falling because from their fractured worldview, they see racism, bigotry, and hate everywhere. And they see diseases and temperatures that will surely mass extinct us all tomorrow. They're absolutely convinced that the world is worse off today than it was 100 years ago and getting worse. But unlike in Chicken Little, the sky just keeps not 
following. On Twitter, whenever I see another media headline declaring yet another climate change end of all humanity headline, I respond with a screenshot of an AP article I now have at the ready. This AP article, which was written in 1989, is titled, UN predicts disaster if global warming not checked. And the first line reads, entire nations could could be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if the global warming trend is not reversed by the year 2000. Well, here we are, 23 years after that deadline, and the temperature hasn't caused a single country to sink and disappear into the sea. Yet this lunacy continues because they're so convinced of their own BS <laughs> that the world and the facts within it must bend to their will, not the other way around. <clears throat> and their actions follow suit. Regressive policies like segregated student unions and moving the world away from fossil fuel reliance are the fruit of their poisonous tree. They've got America's corporate boardrooms so spooked that these people who should know better give in to these delayed adolescents and their emotional rantings. The facts on these issues be damned. It infects everything, and so too has their despair and ingratitude for all that came before them that's responsible for mankind's jump from living in caves to air-conditioned mansions. This perverse thinking not only ignores how good we have it today, but it also makes our real lives worse. I recently saw a tweet by Washington Post liberal journalist, Taylor Lorenz. <laughs> if you don't know of her, suffice it to, to say she's an all around very unpleasant person. In her doom saying, she blamed late stage capitalism, whatever that is, the COVID pandemic and climate change for her bleak outlook. She said that all hope is lost and that it's delusional to find optimism in anything about our country or society at the moment. That's freaking insane. We live in a world that is wealthier than at any point in history safer from disaster than at any point in history, more resilient to disease than at any point in history, and generally more comfortable than at any point in history. Everyone in this room has access to virtually the entire base of knowledge that's ever existed. The Lost Library of Alexandria has nothing on that iPhone in your pocket. We live in an era where we control the temperature of a room at the push of a button. Think of how hot the Texas summer gets. Now imagine being one of the original 300 Texans dealing with that summer every year without air conditioning. I know I couldn't do it. And certainly, none of these doomsayers who want us to only have wind and solar as our energy sources could either. According to the website Human Progress, men thousands, see, thousands of years ago had to chop wood 10 hours a day for six days straight just to produce the equivalent of 54 minutes of light from a modern bulb. Today that amount of effort would get you 52 years of light. And that's, and what's the most amazing thing about all of this? It's all affordable for the average person. For goodness sake, the definition of poverty in America today allows for the ownership of flat screen TVs. I mean, I remember when those were a luxury that cost thousands of dollars. Now they cost a few hundred. Apple's first personal computer cost $7,300 in today's dollars. Today you can buy a laptop that can do laps around that. That one by only a couple and, and purchased for only a couple hundred dollars. Even more can fit into your bag. It ain't all material improvements either. People today live longer than a century or more ago. In all but the most extreme circumstances, a simple cut is not going to result in a serious illness or kill you like it once could. Infant mortality during the 20th century declined nearly 99%. 
And after five decades of that horrendous and brutal court precedent created in Roe v. Wade, it was overturned and abortion was abolished in the state of Texas, saving thousands of lives. There are very real problems we face today. It's certainly not all sunshine and rainbows. But I'll let you in on a little secret. There have always been and always will be problems. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the fact is described as, quote, there's nothing new under the sun. The problems you face are not new. Someone somewhere in the past has experienced the same or something very similar. That's an important perspective to have. It's when we lose appreciation for what came before us that we lose any grasp on reality and how to live our own lives. In the 1960s, the hippies thought they had all the answers, that everyone that came before them was wrong. Not only did they rebel against po the politics of the day, but the hygiene too. <laughs> Either out of arrogance or pure laziness, many of them shrugged off simple practices like washing hands. <laughs> well, a ways into their childish rebellion against the status quo, doctors began finding diseases that hadn't been seen for centuries. Diseases with names, oh, uh, like the itch, the grunge, the mange, and the rot. Uh, I won't say it very loud since y'all are eating. <laughs> when despair rules the day, all hope for real progress, the kind that actually makes people's lives better, goes out the window. Instead, we regress. And one of the biggest and most recent examples of regression by society is exactly what Lorenz has called for, continuing to calm her fear of the outside. Government's reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic not only resulted in real and continuous financial turmoil, but so many people drove themselves halfway to crazy town as a result of that virus. It pushed Lorenz and so many others all the way there. With the legacy media as its cheerleader, government pushed a health policy dependent not on basic rules of hygiene or herd immunity, but on cloth masks and six foot distancing. Rather than protecting the elder and practicing basic hygiene, businesses were shut down, livelihoods erased, schools were closed, children stunted. But of course, during this very same time, we made exceptions to this ridiculous, to these ridiculous dictates. For truly the biggest problem of the day, didn't y'all hear? Racism inched closer to eradication with every car set ablaze, black-owned business looted, and struggle sessions held. Businesses shuttered or burned, and children were set back years, but hey, at least we got to coast play anarchy for a little while. These riots of 2022 were emblematic of this despair. For years, officials and professional propagandists have reached the gospel of race-focused despair. No progress has been made on race relations since the 1950s, they told us. And so they had no choice but to take to the streets and burn institutional racism out of their communities, no matter how many people it hurt. And those same officials who so long stoked the same rhetoric who had just implemented the most draconian of COVID policies, were there, linked arm in arm, with the propagandists and their thousands of best friends, all doing exactly what we had just been told was a cardinal sin. You know how hard it is to scream about how terrible police are while wearing a face mask? Apparently pretty dang difficult, because what did the protesters turned rioters do? They pulled them down. The kind of thing related in a pharmacy or a restaurant. What's the common thread these COVID radicals and other doomsayers have, which Taylor Lorenz personifies perfectly? They believe life's bumps and challenges cannot be overcome or dealt with themselves. They've made professional victims of themselves under attack 
from invisible assailants. In less extreme examples, it's clear a malaise has washed over the country. There are hundreds of thousands of job openings, yet many still rest on their laurels unemployed. Business owners are begging for workers. People complain about having little or no purpose, yet don't go find one. Instead, they hope it finds them or choose to without purpose entirely. You know, it's often scoffed at these days, but the old adage of picking yourself up by your bootstraps is not only a real, achievable thing, it's imperative. There's only one person on this earth that can truly change the trajectory of your life. It's you. I was reminded of this again this week when I saw Vivek Ramaswamy, presidential, his presidential announcement video. I knew of this guy, but I really didn't know that much about it. I do know that he's frequently critical of the strain of progressivism sweeping through the financial world, and I absolutely love that about it. I'm usually not a fan of someone getting their feet wet in politics by jumping right into running for president of the United States, and I have no idea how he'll perform in the race. But a lot of what he's saying is resonating with me, and much of the same kind of thing that I'm saying here tonight. One quote of his, <coughs> excuse me, one quote of his in his announcement video, and you'll recognize this message, is quote, to me, the American dream means you believe in merit. That you get ahead in this country, not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. That's not archaic rhetoric and applicable to today. It's, a true, it's as true today as it was 50 years ago. Yet so many choose to live in the malaise, blaming external forces for their lack of satisfaction. Taylor Lorenz is convinced that any number of outside forces are responsible for dismal future. And, she, and so she's convinced herself of a reality that doesn't exist. But guess what? For the most part, life is good. And it sure beats the alternative. We'd all do well to recognize that and act accordingly. Out of all the points in human history, we could have lived in all of the places we could have been born in, God placed us here. At the best time in human history, in the best country the world has ever seen, in the best state in the union. Let's be grateful for that. We have real problems. Every society does and will. But having issues is not the end of the world. Far from it. The world keeps spinning. The sun will come up tomorrow. Calvin Coolidge once said, if you see ten troubles coming down the road, you can be sure that nine will run into the ditch before they reach you. So long as you approach life clear-headed and don't make more problems for yourself, you'll realize most roadblocks can be stepped over. It's on you to make your life better, to find your purpose. And believe me, everyone can find that. There's a purpose for each of us out there. For you longhorns in here, grab life by the horns. For you Abbeys, for you Abbeys, grab life, I don't know, what do you grab life by? <laughs> in the heart of Texas, a place people from all over the country are literally flocking to. State officials often say Texas adds a population the size of Corpus Christi every year. It's amazing to see. There's a reason that many people come here. This is where opportunity is, the growth, the prosperity, the future. Texas is the place to be. But guess what? You're already here. No longer a statistic in waiting. At whatever stage you're currently at, you're already started on whatever path you're on. And it's brought to you, or kept you, in Texas. It's not a one-way street, either. But the state of Texas needs you. It wouldn't be Texas without Texans. And being a Texan is a state of mind very much in line with pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. It's hard-nosed, stubborn, and unapologetic about welcome, but welcoming, excuse me, respectful, and proud. 
Carl Sandburg described it as a blend of valor and swagger. John Steinbeck said of Texas, for all its enormous range of space, climate, and physical appearance, and for all the internal squabbles, contentions, and strivings, Texas has a tight cohesiveness, perhaps stronger than any other section of America. Rich, poor, panhandle, gulf, city, country, Texas is the obsession, the proper study, and the passionate possession of all Texans. That American dream the vet describes is the Texas reality. Merit trumps entitlement. Contributions trump mere existence. And character trumps arrogance. It's a rich bounty we've been blessed with. It's up to us to make something of it. Now go do it. Thank you and God bless Texas. Thank you. Who can come on after that? Let's give her another round. That's well, we're almost at the close of an amazing weekend, and looking at the smiles on these faces, you're waiting for dessert. It's on, on like two minutes from your dessert, right? I'm the uh, faculty advisor for the Young Conservative Texas on the University of Houston campus. Give that coops. Where's my coos? <laughs> okay, I'm trying to say howdy. Come on. Where's my coos? All right. Howdy. All right. But I'll, I'll tell you one thing. I'm a graduate of UT, so there we go. <laughs> but I wear many hats too because I, uh, after I graduated and I went to graduate school and then I ended up in Indiana and then I studied in Miami and then I came to Houston. Wow. That's a long way. But everybody here thinks, oh, she's got her economics degree or law degree or anything. I'm an eye doctor, <laughs> okay? I help people see to the right. <laughs> All right, there we go. I, I was brought up with conservative values, like all of you in this room. In fact, I don't call them conservative values at all. I call them American values because my parents came for the American dream, first generation right here. And a lot of your parents came, or your parents, parents and everything, looking for that American dream. And somehow we're missing it. I worked in a very, very busy hospital, seeing 50 patients a day. I was going alone, just all day long. Then in 2020, the pandemic happened. You gotta put that L because it's a loser thing that happened, right? I not only saw patients, but I am a professor at the University of Houston in the clinical, I'm a clinical professor in the optometry school. So I taught second years in med lab, I taught third years in the clinic, and even in my own clinic, I had fourth years doing their internships. So I was busy doing my thing, like everybody, and then the world shuts down. But no one's going to stop me from shutting down. So I started speaking at rallies against the mandates for the masks, against the jabs, against everything that's been happening. I'm, I became the voice which I never thought I would. And why? Because we can't be shut down. And then when I started looking at things, I started speaking out more. I even had my own radio show. Freedom Radio, okay? I did certain things that I never thought I would. If somebody told me I was gonna be doing this 10 years ago, I'd be like, you're funny, I'm the quiet kid in the book, listening to the microscope, that's all I did. Then 2021 came, and you know the world shut down, except Florida and God bless Texas. So when Texas didn't shut down, guess what? CPAC came to Texas, it came to Dallas. What I didn't know what was going to change 
my trajectory for my life changed that day. YCT had a booth there. My sister happened to be attending CPAP. I was trying to start a business. I had to start my life over. I left the hospital, everything. I had to start a brand new practice, not knowing what I was doing, opening a business, doing all these things. Not only that, I was an international speaker on ocular disease. I traveled the world speaking and teaching doctors to be better doctors. Plane shut down, I couldn't travel anymore. I mean, my life changed. So I moved there. And then she met Michael. And she said, hey, YCT. I was a YCT when I was in school. No way. Yeah, way. Who's your, uh, where, where are you at? And he's like, University of Houston. Except that we can't be at the University of Houston on campus because we can't find a faculty advisor. My sister goes, huh, my sister's a professor at the University of Houston. You want me to give her a call? And that changed everything. For nine years, they've been looking for a faculty advisor. They looked in the wrong place. Go to science classes. We do not care what color your hair is. We do not, we know if you're a boy or a girl, look down, okay? <laughs> And the fact that I got a degree in microbiology makes me know this, okay? What, did, what was it, Katanji? I don't know what a woman is because we didn't have a biology degree. Well, I do, okay? So he calls me and he says, would you like to do this? And I said, sure, I was a YCT too. And he's like, you're kidding. I said, no, I can't get a kid up, right? And that changed everything. And so I went to a couple of meetings and there's just a couple of students, two or three students, and I said, okay, I'm watching how things are going. And I said, do you want to take this to another level or do you like kind of what's going on here? And he said, well, what do you got in mind? I got big things because I only think big. Because we're in Texas. <laughs> got to think bigger in Texas, right? So what do we do? We had a small little tiny little event bringing in Coulter. I thought, let's get the most controversial person I can think of, right? Thanks to all these people. And I thought, he said, how are we going to fill the chairs? And the students don't know who they are. I said, don't worry, I got this. I'll go out to the community and I'll tell them we have a chapter on the University of Houston campus. We need the support of the community in order for it to thrive and grow. So we did it. We raised six thousand dollars. Wow, awesome. Okay? Because we asked. Nobody knows that we exist until we ask. Then we decided to do something maybe a little bit more controversial. We brought Matt Walsh. What is a woman? We know what a woman is. We had 1,200 students wrapping around the building three times, had to turn away, I don't know, about 700 kids, and they came from everywhere, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, plus all around Texas. Every time I went out there, the Antifa mobs kept growing, the mounted police were everywhere. You should see, it was pretty cool to see cops on horseback, right? It's pretty awesome. So they're going, okay, Dr. Nanda, if you don't get your butt back, if you don't get your dairy air back in there, we cannot protect you from these wackos. I said, okay, fine, I'm back in. But I kept trying to find my students and pulling them in, and it was amazing. The coup de grace was on 9-11 when we decided to have our founder, Steve Ministeri, come. <laughs> He came, he spoke, Louis Gohmert happened to come, Kevin Brady happened to come, and so did Brandon Creighton. We had the top of the top here, and they all came to the University of Houston because they knew we existed. And if they didn't know we existed, this is why we need you out there. We need you donors to help us, to grow us, to make us bigger, better, stronger. Which brings me to maybe our next event, which even these students don't even know that I'm cooking in behind the scenes. I am also a freedom doctor. I'm not just, you know, one of the, I told you, I wear many hats. Uh, I speak everywhere. I speak out against these mandates and these jabs and these vaxes and everything. So what I would like to do is to bring the freedom doctors to our campus. Okay? Peter McCullough, Brian Artis. And in fact, we were talking to maybe Silk of Diamond and Silk, so she might be coming too. So I've got a few things planned, but again, I need everyone's help. And of course, every chapter is invited, all right? Is that good? So that's what I'm trying to plan there. 
And so what I want to do too, because I do have a little bit of a creative spirit, because I, I just like doing these things. Um, I like to kind of capsulize everything in a poem. So how many people know Paul Revere's Ride with uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow? Anybody familiar with it? Do we not have any patriots in the room? Anybody familiar with it? Yeah, there we go. All right. I changed it to Patriots Revered, Paul Revered. And it's basically about what's been happening in these last two years, especially to me because my world changed. But I see it as it changed for the better because if we hadn't been locked down, I wouldn't have found you guys. So that's his intervention, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Listen, my friends, and you shall hear of the midnight fight that we patriots revere. On the 13th of March in 2020, the virus had spread and fear was plenty. We said to Pharma, if a vax is made, the world we live in could be saved. From team, uh, by Team Moderna or even Team Pfizer, from the evil Dr. Fauci, the lockdown Kaiser. <laughs> One if by shot and two if by booster, we must slow down this viral producer, ready to inject and sound the alarm through all the cities and towns and each and every farm. We must deliver the shot to every man's arm. So millions of vaccines were created and readily they were disseminated. The country's people got their dose, and the nation became less morose. The masks came off, the children could play, and hug and kiss their grandmas as before that bleak day. But things changed as the world was rearranged. Shots became mandates, or you couldn't go to work. Suddenly the government went completely Berserk. The doctors and nurses who were once heroes were now denounced and became complete zeros. More and more got the shots with trepidation. If they didn't comply, they'd face discrimination. Evil worked while malevolence abounds. Pfizer didn't share what their studies really found. O'Keefe of Veritas discovered Pfizer's plan that would make them rich their entire lifespan. They would create their own virus and launch another vax, then bribe the government with their lobbying packs. Some were plotting, others dropped like flies. They called it coincidence to spread their wicked lies. The body will shut down as the spike protein grows. The problem won't stop until this evil booster goes. People with tremors and palpitation. People with tremors amid palpitation with myocarditis now is a common observation. Healthy athletes are dying of climate change? This is utter nonsense and completely deranged. What do we do? Do we cry or complain to see a loved one with cancer in the brain? What's in this fax? We still do not know, but mankind is discovering its deathly blow. How many of your friends and family must die before our government will face this terrible lie? It's time to stop the shots. It's time to stop it now. Here's what we do. I'll explain how. Tell your senators, tell your congressmen ASAP that we've had enough and tired of this stuff. <laughs> Call them every day and blow up their phone. No time to delay, no time to postpone. Listen to me now, 
we have to use our voice. It's time we support Texans for Vaccine Choice. Wickedness is around us, but there is goodness too. We must band together and God will pull us through. People will awaken and listen to hear this do or die message our patriots will hear. In order to end this nightmare, we need to be clear, exclaim, stop the shots, do so three times without any fear. Say it with me, let's get into gear. Stop the shots. Stop the shots. Stop the shots. May God bless all of you. God bless America, the young conservatives of Texas. Support freedom, support the YCTs, and support our students. Let's get the U of H students up here. We have the proclamation that Steve Mosteri gave to us on 9-11, and I would like all my UT U of H Bad, my bad. <laughs> you make, uh, people come up here and we'll take a picture. Thank you guys. God bless you. chapters actually operate their own independent campus publications. So these are conservative student-run newspapers uh, that have been fairly successful on their campuses and uh, they've had a lot of impact in just spreading YCT's messages across campuses in Texas. So I'm very proud to announce that the winner of this year's award goes to Trinity YCT's chapter publication, The Tower. Can I get a Trinity YCT representative up? Also, feel free to uh, insert the raffle tickets over here on any prizes you want to win. Uh, that's going to be open for just a little while longer. <laughs> Next 
Next up, we have the Kobe Piper and Brianna Becker Award. Kobe Piper. Kobe Piper and Brianna Becker Award for conservative dedication. This year, this award is going to the person who helped lead YCT out of COVID and served YCT selflessly under many titles, helping to craft multiple legislative and policy documents over the last several years, as well as preparing many, if not all, of our email newsletters that are received by members, alumni, donors, and friends of YCT. The winner of this year's award is Julia Crucius. Everyone, please give her a big round of applause. Next up is the Chairman's Award. Um, we have so many excellent YCTers this year that this is just an impossible award to give to just one person. So there are two individuals in this room who have been a tremendous help this year. They have done, I, I can't even begin to create a list of how many things they've done. They have been overachievers for YCT, spent hundreds of hours, if not more, doing anything and everything they can to support YCT and make sure we are the amazing organization we are. So I'd like it if everyone could please give a round of applause to Michael Moore and Kevin Crucius. Now, I know there's an award that everyone that knows what awards YCT gives out has been waiting for. Um, so this is going to be our chapter of the year. And this is once again one where we cannot pick a single winner. We have two amazing chapters that have worked tremendously hard and have had exponential growth, many successful events. They, they have been knocking doors, making phone calls, they have done everything possible they can to be the best YCT chapters possible. So, uh, would the chapter chairs for the University of Dallas and the University of Houston please come up on stage? But um, I was told if I felt it necessary, um, I could add an award. And so this award goes to, really it's named after a family in YCT that has been probably some of the biggest overachievers of the last 15 years. The person this is going to today um, has held many titles in YCT, chapter chair, state board member, he's even served as executive director. This dude has gone 
over and above the call of duty of any YC tier. And we've had many highs, many lows together over the years. And uh, on top of that, he's mentored probably every chapter chair in this room at some point in time. So everyone, please give a big round of applause for Manfred Wendt, the first winner of the Wendt Family Award for Excellence. Tyler Colvin and Rebecca Wendt. Not a day goes by where I don't miss them and think about what could have been. This is Rebecca and Tyler's, should have been their last convention as seniors for Trinity University. For those of you who don't know, on June 10th, or July 10th, 2020, Tyler and Rebecca tragically lost their life in a car wreck. And that is the reason why the Trinity University seal has two black stars, and it will have two black stars for as long as YCT exists. And I want to thank everybody who I have had the opportunity to mentor. I want to thank the people who have mentored me. Just in front of me, I see Will Lutz, Connie Burton, Donna Davidson. Um, this award is the culmination of everyone's efforts over the past couple of years. Um, I know the past couple of years between COVID, the loss of members has not always been easy on us, but we have continued to persevere and fight forward and honor the legacy of those we've lost. Um, the Colby P Kite, was it Peeper? Peeper, Peeper. And what was the other name? Peeper and Brianna Becker? Brianna, Brianna Becker. She oh. also was uh, killed in traffic accident. Yeah, YCT has a legacy of honoring those who never graduated for tragic reasons. So. Thank you, Nate, for this award. I look forward to this award in the future being used to represent a very high honor for YCT. And not a day goes by where I don't miss Rebecca and Tyler. So thank you all for coming, and let's continue to build a legacy and an organization that they would be proud of. Thank you, Nate. back on stage for a group photo, if we can. our photos. Um, I'd like to give a special thank you to Clark and I have been into taking photos, volunteering his time for YCT. So I just want to say thank you. All right. So this was a tradition from my, uh, my first YCT convention that we didn't get to do last year, but uh, I wanted to bring it back, which was the YCT family photo. So if you are a YCT member, let's crowd the stage and all get one giant photo together. 
Sebastian, that includes you. And Betty. You too, Jordan. Manfred.
Fernando, you count.
awesome. Yes. 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 Yes.
City alumni and let us decide to bring it. Students or alumni? Students or alumni?
Texas A&M, students and alumni, young folks, West Texas A&M. West Texas A&M, students and alumni. Alex Casillas, Alex Casillas. Alex Casillas, anyone? Anyone? Well, I guess they're not winning anything, right? All right. We're on our last one. So if you're a member of the YCT State Board, please join us on the stage. Brandon, get on the stage, too. Oh, 
Toto Speaker. Toto Speaker. Three, two, six, two, one, seven. Three, two, six, two, one, seven. Three, two, six, two, one, seven. Going once, going twice, it's gone. Eight, nine, four, eight, two, three. Eight, nine, four, eight, two, three. Three two six five five six for the AirPods. Three two six. Three two six five five six. Three two six. Yep, you got it. Congratulations. Thank you. 